the College of Complexes. And we're glad to see you. And uh, we're having a, uh, a real energy time tonight. We're going to hear from Andy Anderson about uh, President Obama's new energy plan, uh, the Keystone Pipeline, and fracking, and all that sort of thing. Uh, will you, uh, here is our speaker himself. Information Service. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. For those of you that may be new that don't know me, um, my name is Andy Anderson, Linson Anderson, and I'm from the Northwest Information Service in Palatine. And my brother and I run as a public service, we run a database translation service. That is to say, we take books, we read and digest books, and collect the information from a wheelbarrow full of paper, 10, 15, 20 different books on a subject, <clears throat> and translate that mass, the essence of it, into a one-page cliff notes like this, one or two pages that somebody can read in five minutes because there's no, the average person doesn't have time to read 20 books a week. <clears throat> and we specialize in blacked out subjects, things that reporters can get fired for writing about in America. There are some things uh, as a reporter, uh, like in Mexico, uh, if you talk about certain things, you don't get fired, they just send somebody out and kill you. In America, you get fired and blackballed and your career goes into the shredder. Uh, in 2004, a woman named Christina Borgesson wrote a book called Into the Buzzsaw that describes that actual process. She took 18 stories of 18 different Pulitzer Prize winners that had long time good successful professional journalism careers until every one of them was surprised that one day they were trying to report a story to the public. They thought it was something that the public should know and they just got fired and blackballed. And what we're going to be talking tonight about is one of those stories uh, that is um, the core issue is one thing, but there are several other things that are happening that are also being driven uh, by the core myth. Um, I brought a few books here tonight. I'm going to try, in the past, we've had some complaints, you might say, that it's, um, my talks, uh, the difficult part for me is trying to, as the old saying is, cram 50 pounds of potatoes into a 20 pound sack in 10 minutes worth of time. Um, there's just so many things that come to mind on blacked out subjects and pieces of information you can give people because uh, my brother and I have been digesting this stuff for 30 years. So um, when the, we'll change the rule just slightly tonight. As I'm talking, if somebody, if there's a fact you're not familiar with, uh, I give you a piece of information. If you want to know the source of the, the book that summarizes that, just hold up your hand and I'll yell out the source of that book right for the camera so that anybody watching this video for an hour you know, later can see the sources throughout. You, we won't have to wait to the rebuttal time or the questions and answers time. So. Tonight's talk is basically going to be a story about billionaire predators who are running our country. Um, it's, you can't understand what's happening in the oil industry or the gas industry or the water industry or um, the energy industry with nuclear power or the media industry without understanding that our country was taken over by billionaires, billionaire predators, with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Uh, they, they started setting the groundwork in 1973. This book, What Went Wrong, by uh, George R. Tyler, 
describes the turn that America took with predators officially taking over the government in 1980 with the election of Ronald Reagan and the billionaire predators that own the media don't report certain things and they report other myths. So all through the Reagan years, we were told that uh, shoveling money to rich people with totally unregulated, free, laissez-faire capitalism is the best way to run a country. And so we had deregulation of the savings and loan industry, the predators ran wild, and they robbed the country of $500 billion. And uh, that scandal broke in 1987. So after Ronald Reagan was out of office, George Bush took over from 88 to 92. So basically for 12 years we had the Bush, the Bush crime family running the government. <laughs> And the public got a belly full of it by 1992, and they voted for a change. They voted President Clinton in. Well, with free trade, NAFTA, the loss of jobs, the deregulation of banks, a lot of things going down on Clinton's watch, Clinton turned out to be what we thought was going to be the best Republican president of all time. Until George Bush came along in the year 2000. Um, In 2000, it was recognized, um, the corporate predators had a plan. In, in about 1998 or so, described in this book, Energy Switch and... There's a, a, an institution called Rocky Mountain Institute. They, uh, this book is back from a few years ago. It's called Reinventing Fire. And it's a story of how America has been converting to energy efficiency with new technologies over the last 35 years. They're talking about houses without furnaces, 100 mile per gallon cars, uh, a whole energy conversion. That's Amory Lovins from Rocky Mountain Institute. And uh, this book, Energy Switch, by Craig Morris was published in 2006. I made some notes. Some of my, um, on the, the green page, all of you have got one of these green flyers on the back page of that. It says available renewable energy. The core of our talk on fracking, when we get to it, revolves around the concept that we are totally bathed every day in 10,000 times more energy than the human race uses coming in from the sun. But Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, all the others, talking about new high efficiency lights, motors, refrigerators, uh, houses without furnaces. <clears throat> By 1998, two years before the election in 2000, by about 1998, the concept was spreading through the oil and gas and nuclear companies. And they recognized that very shortly, uh, by 1998, wind power had come down in price like cell phones and DVD players, video recorders, when wind power had gone through the same learning curve and the price was still dropping but by 1998 the handwriting was on the wall for the oil what Harvey Wasserman calls coal oil nukes and gas industry he refers to them as King Kong King Kong recognized in 1998 they said we have to do something to keep America dependent on our expensive foreign oil and gas and everything else for the next 30 years because the people are going to be wanting to switch to cheaper, safer solar and wind power and all kinds of high efficiency renewals. So they put together a plan and then uh, they published it back in 1999. It was called a project for a new American century. Dick Cheney, the Bush family, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, a whole bunch of the top 25 people that ran the Bush administration when they got control of the White House those top 25 people running the government were the early signatories of that program, uh, the report, the project for a new American century. And they said, we have, to, we have to transform the Middle East into something friendly to the American oil companies. That means sending our troops and uh, their plan was we can convert seven countries in five years once we get control of the White House. And they recognized that what they call uh, taking over and controlling countries would be viewed by others as 
violations of the Nuremberg principles, just going into a country. The, the last 20, 25 years of the American military industrial complex along with the corporations is, is accurately described in the movie Avatar. And Jake holds up a book. He says, you know, she wrote the book on it. This is how you do it. You find out where the resources are that you want to dig up. You find out who's living over that land and you try to negotiate with them for cheap, and if they won't give you their resources, you declare them the enemy and send in the Marines to wipe them out. And then you can start drilling for oil or mining for whatever it is. So our military, since 1935, when General Smedley Butler blew the whistle on him, he published a book called War is a Racket. War is a Racket by Smedley Butler. He said uh, he was the most decorated Marine general in history. He's, he's revered among the Marines as a god. And he said, I was muscle for the mob. We weren't fighting for freedom anywhere in the world. We were keeping the third world safe for American corporations. And that's been the story ever, ever since you know, the end of the Korean War. Vietnam, everything on forward, all the military skirmishes that the United States has been involved in has been uh, moving people off the land and overthrowing over overthrowing uh, democratically elected people that wanted to use their country's resources for the benefit of the people. This is why the Bush administration hated uh, the, the, uh, Hugo Chavez from Pennsylvania, uh, from Yugoslavia, not Pennsylvania. Uh, Hugo Chavez turned that country around by using the oil wealth and the profits from it to actually help the people. And other countries are doing the same thing. Iceland is doing that, uh, but I digress. We'll, well, when we got to, after the Project for a New American Century was published in, in 1999, they started plans. They had they, they started mapping out the plans about how they were going to divide up Iraq. There's a, Dick Cheney produced a map showing it looked like a big side of beef where they they cut uh, you know the butcher cuts out the various things. This part will go to British Petroleum. This part will go to Exxon Mobil. This will go to Shell. And they said we'll we'll start dividing up Iraq as soon as we can move in there. Well. They realized the project for a new American century, the core of that, the essence of that report said the transformation to take over the Middle East, uh, the transformation will be a long one unless, you know, if it's absent some kind of catalyzing, catastrophic event like a new Pearl Harbor. They said we need a new Pearl Harbor to motivate Congress and the American people to support the turning America into a military industrial police state. So also they recognized the people that wrote that report, they said any ordinary president, an ordinary president with um, a moderate semblance of ethics, morals, or conscience won't touch this with a 10-foot pole. We need to install somebody in the White House that basically has no ethics, no morals, and no conscience, and will sign any piece of paper, any kind of crime against humanity that's pushed in front of him, he'll sign it and give it the law of the land. So they ran George Bush for president, and they quietly started uh, setting the goal for suppressing the vote in certain key states, and when it became obvious that George and Dick had lost the 2000 election. They created a riot in Florida and stopped the vote counting, and then they ran to the Supreme Court, and uh, the criminals on the Supreme Court, masquerading as judges, issued a five to four ruling declaring that George was the winner. Just give him the White House. So uh, there's a very large database of documented information on each of these things I'm telling you. If, the, if any of you are taking notes or you want to know the books or websites that this comes off of, it's a, it's a translation of a large database, not the opinion of one or two writers. Uh, that's what we do. So uh, I don't really express opinions on things that I don't have a massive amount of data to back it up. 
on a lot of things. Now, some of you think that I stand up here and express opinions. When it's an opinion, I'll tell you it is. Okay? If you have a question, if you know, if you have a question whether it's my opinion or a summary of what I call Albert and his friends, take Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends from the physics department. Collectively, you have thousands of years of uh, you know credibility and research among them. What are you going to do with Albert and his friends when they say the Earth isn't flat? We'd appreciate it if the Earth that you wouldn't say the Earth is flat. Stop saying the Earth is flat at your press conferences, Mr. President. We got pictures from the space shuttle. Well, on many key issues that we're going to be talking about tonight, there's an equivalent group of thousands of researchers that have been risking their lives and careers all over the world to publish books, articles, internet articles, all kinds of published material that never sees the light of day in the American press. Things are common knowledge around the world, but not here. So, they took control of the White House and they installed one of the popular myths, one of the strongest myths that still exists in America is people still refer to George Bush and Dick Cheney as president and vice president. Those two people were never president and vice president. They were two corporate criminals that were installed illegally in those offices through massive vote fraud to masquerade as our president and vice president and perform the duties. They were, they were highly paid manservants of the corporate predator billionaires that have taken over America. The people behind the scenes that own the Federal Reserve, the people that own uh, the companies of the military industrial complex, the people that own the oil companies. Incidentally, uh, there's a website called They Rule. There's 118 key people that sit on the board of directors of the top 500, Fortune 500 in America. The same 118 people are interlocked in all the corporate criminal activity that's being done by the, you know, the military, what, what Eisenhower warned us is the military, military industrial complex. I call it the corporate media medical industrial complex because the pharmaceutical industry is heavily involved in this also along with the media. There's billionaire predators at the top that are showing us what happens to a nation when you don't regulate sharks. If you allow people that have sociopathic tendencies, no ethics, no morals, no conscience, they make up about 4% of any population. When those people rise to the top and they're not regulated, then you end up with a country, you can, you can end up with a country where the, the population tolerates a business owner, say one of the five owners of Walmart, they can, they can effectively say, we can't pay our people a living wage because I only have 22 billion in the bank. I got two kids to put through college and with 22 billion I'm not secure. Uh, that's not greed. That's a sociopathic, bordering on psychopathic illness. Uh, and these people are absolutely, we've been, since 1980, with this, this book, What Went Wrong and a bunch of others, they talk about the middle class being solidly under attack. There really isn't any war going on in Afghanistan and Iraq. There's a controlled slaughter over there. The real war is an economic war on the people, the middle, the middle class of America. We've been under attack now for 33 years, solidly under attack. And if we don't do something to combat it, then the middle class is gone. And uh, we're, we're close. A couple more minutes of the introduction, then we'll get into the, the main body of the talk tonight, which is about the benefits of fracking uh, and other programs that the president supports. As I said, uh, once, once the predators had total control of the White House in the year 2001, Cheney started having meetings with all the oil company executives to how to divide up spoils in Iraq. They knew were going. They knew when they were going into Iraq. Basically, they they were planning on going into Afghanistan. They notified leaders over near and around Afghanistan and Pakistan, those areas, our friends. They said, "Don't get alarmed because our troops are going to be in Afghanistan 
uh, hunting for terrorists in, in the middle of October or so, no later than mid-October. And our troops uh, were getting their shots back in June. This is all before 9-11 happened. They had a plan, and the media sold that plan to us seamlessly, 24-7. Um, and the media presented the Bush administration as being totally incompetent. For eight years, we were treated to things that, uh, well, they weren't competent on 9-11, they didn't see it coming, they were incompetent on Hurricane Katrina, they couldn't respond. It was the incompetence defense for eight solid years when just the reality, the, just the opposite is a reality. And, and Hurricane Katrina, uh, the George Bush's administration did a fine job. They responded immediately. They roped the city off with armed guards. They prevented 500 boats brought by citizens from getting there and helping people. They refused help from the hospital ship. They let uh, like 1,700 people die in the floodwaters in the first days of that without food, water, or help. And well, one congressman said, we, we, you know, we couldn't clean out New Orleans, but God finally did it. They, you know, and of course, the Bush administration, uh, starting back with Jerry Falwell in the Reagan years, they were dominated by people uh, from the right wing of the Christian party that today, uh, the top 10 things they believe would qualify as antichrist beliefs. I, I divide Christians into two separate groups. Pro-Christ Christians that believe in the teachings of Jesus and the Ten Commandments, and antichrist Christians that are calling themselves Christians, but every plank on their agenda is 100% antichrist. Let the poor people starve in the floodwaters. Uh, you know, go kill people in foreign countries. We're out of, uh, the Air Force teaches out in Colorado, they tell their uh, new Air Force recruits coming in, uh, the chaplains are right-wing Christians. You're on a crusade, you're on a mission from God, and World War III is probably coming, so we gotta be prepared. In 1987, the world rose up and shut down the thinking that you can win a nuclear war as long as you strike first. Uh, the insanity of the teachings of the Reagan years finally hit critical mass in the summer of 87 and Gorbachev was first, Reagan had to follow right after it. They shut down their nuclear launch hardware. 18 months later or so in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down and we thought we would have some peace. But shortly after that we got the first Gulf War. And uh, the first Gulf War was all about establishing a foothold in the Middle East so that uh, we would be able to control the oil fields. It's been all about oil, gas, you know, um, coal, oil, nuclear, and gas. The, those, those big energy companies have their tentacles wrapped around the face of humanity like what Matt Taibbi called, like a giant vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity. They consider global profits to be their natural God-given right, and anything that gets in the way of that, well, we're sorry so many people got killed in Yemen or wherever it was, but um, we're sorry that people have to die in the search for resources, but it's not personal, it's just business. And that's, that's the attitude. And early on in 2000, leading up to this all-out drive for uncontrolled drilling in the oceans, uncontrolled, unregulated fracturing on land, unregulated mountaintop removal, blasting. They passed uh, laws in the first couple of years exempting energy companies from the damage for their pollution. And, uh, and then we had the Patriot Act, 9-11 happened. Incidentally, uh, the media had the script on the morning of 9-11. Uh, Gene here, a college regular, brought me this newspaper article. It's a picture of a high-rise building, Building, you know, it's 40, 50 stories tall, um, somewhere in a foreign country. This is a Spanish um, newspaper. He can read that. Anyway, the, the, the gist of the article is being recorded all over the world. If you have a fire in a high-rise building, it can be from gasoline, butane, tank blowing up, you can burn the whole building and after the fire goes out, you can rebuild it better than new because the steel structure is not affected by the fire. So the media had the script on the morning of 
and the, they had cameras in place to film the Twin Towers so that when the first plane hit, all the cameras from all the, the networks were focused on selling the script. And when the second plane hit, a little while later they interviewed a guy on the street in a baseball cap that turned out to be an un, unemployed actor. Uh, they had actors, uh, people uh, positioned around New York and the Pentagon to report the official story as the media were interviewing these people. And this guy said, oh yeah, I saw both planes go in, and then an hour later uh, the fire was so hot the buildings just collapsed and everything else. And then the media ran with that story, while later in the day, Dan Rather and some others were reporting in real time. You can look up the video. Dan Rather was saying, um, well, didn't that building look like it just came down in a controlled demolition? You could see him just go straight down in your old footprint. He's talking about Building 7 that came down at 520 in the afternoon. Uh, if any of you, let me have a show of hands. Who's here seen a billboard or a thing on a taxi cab that says Rethink 9-11? There's a nationwide education of, you've seen one of those? Mm -hmm. Was it on a billboard or a taxi cab? Taxi cab. Taxi cab in Chicago? Yes. In major cities, they're running a month-long campaign. It's a coalition of 40 groups, firemen, policemen, architects, and engineers. Hundreds of thousands of people form these coalitions to educate the world that 9-11 was a total inside job done by, orchestrated by, people at the highest levels of the Bush administration. For those of you that may be interested, Here's a book published by Kevin R. Ryan. It's called Another 19, Investigating Legitimate 9-11 Suspects. This book is a history book of the history of Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, Richard Armitage, uh, a bunch of people that were in key positions of the military, uh, the air traffic controllers. Uh, Cheney was in the White House. Uh, Bush was off, he was pushed off into a, a school in Florida reading a book with kids so that he wouldn't uh, step out of line and mumble something that wasn't, you know, was off script. Uh, script, in other words. They kept Bush out of the way so that they could run 9-11 smoothly and get the uh, official story out of Osama bin Laden by noon. So if you're interested in who actually had the means, motive, opportunity, and were in the offices, that's, that's called Another 19. Uh, Kevin Ryan, incidentally, was worked for the Underwriters Laboratory, and uh, he was responsible working with the people that certified the steel that was used to build the Twin Towers. And when he, he sent a note to the government, he requested the report that said the steel melted from the, the kerosene flame because Underwriters Laboratory had certified the steel girders to withstand at least 2,000 degrees for six hours without any damage at all. So Kevin and the others that uh, worked with steel, they were among the first ones to say, this idea that the kerosene just uh, running for a few minutes melted the steel and boom, the buildings fell down, that's a, a total myth. It's a bald-faced lie. So the media in America, the media, uh, to get people to believe in a myth, it's a two-pronged process. You promote the myth on all channels 24-7, and you simultaneously run a coordinated blackout on the event. Essentially, you black out Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends saying the Earth isn't flat. Uh, and this is what people from the Underwriters Laboratory, all kinds of university professors, scientists from all over the world, and especially Professor Judy Wood. I don't have her book here. Professor Judy Wood is a physicist, a chemistry and physicist professor from Clemson. She wrote a book called Where Did the Towers Go? It's a physics textbook, and on that cover is a picture of the dust cloud of one of the two twin towers collapsing. She said on the morning of 9-11, she was told, she's listening to the television, they're saying, the building's collapsing. Look at that, the building's collapsing. She says, what are they talking about? That building is being blown to dust. The two twin towers did not collapse. That's the first fact you need to know. The two twin towers did not collapse to the ground. They went sideways in the wind, scattered over several miles of lower Manhattan as a cloud of dust. Well, several physicists collectively, when they started the study, they said that we had to invent a new word for what happened to the towers. They weren't just demolished. They were dustified. And a lot of the dust particles were one-tenth the size of a red blood cell. 
there was some kind of massive energy. Uh, they think it's a new technique they've been practicing for demolishing buildings and not leaving any real residue on the ground. It just spread over the, the landscape. But the top, as I said, um, three simple facts you need to know that got the myth started. Three simple facts that a seventh grader can understand. One, the media told us, well, they didn't tell us about the third building, but that's what the, the billboard campaign asked the question. Just one big question said, did you know that three towers came down in the morning of 9-11? A lot of people in New York didn't even know about the third tower because they completely blacked it out after Dan Rather reported it at 5.20 in the evening that it was a controlled demolition of 47-story building. Total media blackout by 9 o'clock. They had the script ready and then all through the night. Thank you, my friend. Next days, day after day after day, yes. they referred to the destruction of New York as the destruction of the Twin Towers. Because here's the thing. A 6th or a 7th grader can do the math. And that leaves all of us you, not being able to claim uh, we can't do the math of a 7th grader. Three buildings, three bu buildings went down from two plane crashes. Do the math. That's the first fact you start with. That That's the smoking gun. That's why they never talk about Building 7, because it wasn't hit with anything, and there's film on the internet and all over the world showing the layers of explosives going off as the buildings came down. There's films showing uh, the layers of explosives that were triggered to cut the girders in the Twin Towers, but also some other massive form of energy was focused up through the towers to convert the concrete and a lot of the steel into microscopic dust. They were dustified. And the last fact you need to know is it takes weeks to prep buildings like that, if not years. It's suspected that the towers internally for the last couple of two or three years were renovated. There was renovations going on in the elevator shafts and one, one author thinks, one scientist thinks they were painted with a new kind of explosive paint that it's hard to ignite, but once you ignite it, it's called nanothermite and it, it can explode and burn through and dustify steel, concrete, everything else. But in any case, the bomb-sniffing dogs were pulled back from the World Trade Center normal route five days before they came down. And many, many demolition experts have commented on Building 7. The way that came down in a classic controlled demolition, he said, you can't prepare a building like that in a day or two. It takes weeks of preparation. So those two facts, three buildings down from two plane crashes, and two buildings going sideways in the wind. We, the world hasn't seen anything like that since buildings were dustified in Hiroshima and Nagasaki by atomic bombs. That's the only other known mechanism that you have. So Osama bin Laden didn't do it. And uh, Osama bin Laden, actually, there's all kinds of references. Osama bin Laden was our boy. He was on the CIA payroll right up until September 10th. He was helping manage building the myth of 19 hijackers that uh, were in America, members of Al-Qaeda. Uh, the 19 pictures that they showed us were the new Lee Harvey Oswalds of the modern world. And for those of you that haven't studied it, it's been known for almost 40 years that Lee Harvey Oswald didn't fire the shots that killed President Kennedy. But they, they sold the myth on all channels and they blacked out the reality. So uh, this is how the media has kept the American people in a state of artificial ignorance on a bunch of different subjects that would change our country overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. So, once, once the myth of 9-11 was solidly in place, it was off to the races for the criminal bankers, the criminal predators running the oil companies. They were given a green light to, uh, we were going to go to war in the Middle East, uh, in Afghanistan. The only place they were hunting for Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan was along the new oil pipeline route, the 500 mile pipeline that's being built in Afghanistan to transfer oil down uh, you know, through the Caspian Sea. The, uh, there's four big military bases in Iraq and the embassy in Iraq is the size of Vatican City in Rome. They plan on uh, having big mothership embassies, bases over there to coordinate the takeover and control 
of the oil fields for the next you know, 30, 40 years. Because to them, the destruction of the environment uh, is it's collateral damage, but it's, it doesn't really figure into the profit and loss statement. Um, the companies that do mountaintop renewal for coal, they, uh, they're not liable for the streams they pollute and the lands they destroy. Uh, the companies that are drilling for ocean, uh, oil off the ocean, and there has been fracking going on in uh, ocean wells also for the last few years. That, uh, we're just now seeing articles on the internet about that. Uh, if you do a Google search for fracking, you'll see an enormous number of articles about drilling and fracking and the, the collateral damage. Uh, there's two, two good DVD videos you can get, uh, I'm familiar with, uh, the first one was called Gasland, written by uh, Josh, um, what's the guy's name? Josh, um, who, who's the, the filmmaker? Anybody know that one? It's Josh something. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, he produced a movie a, a couple of years ago, uh, the first Gasland, where he interviewed people uh, that had problems after the fracking went on. Their uh, fracking pipes, they drill holes down and slant into the, the rock, and they pump high pressure water mixed with a whole bunch of toxic chemicals at high pressure into these uh, tubes, and they fracture the rock, and then the theory is you get natural gas coming out. Well, anywhere that that process is done, it contaminates the, the, the toxic chemicals that are highly flammable go into the water table, the groundwater, the well water, so that people that are using wells, uh, you know, when they, there's pictures of people holding a cigarette lighter to their kitchen faucet and just lighting the water on fire. The water comes out brown, uh, it's common knowledge that fracking destroys the water tables virtually everywhere they do it. You know, now this is my opinion. We'll have to wait a few years to see if other authors step onto it, but I'm getting the sense that fracking is not really about energy or natural gas. It's about creating a 10 times more profitable gold mine in areas where you can sell people water. You need two things. Humans need two things to live. You need to breathe and you need water. Clean water that you can drink. If you don't have air and water, you have to move. You can't live there. And so they, they haven't figured out how to charge people for breathing air yet. But the fracking is a brilliant plan to develop a new pipeline market for water that people need to live on. And so people are faced with a choice of uh, when uh, in, in an area where there's fracking going on, they either sell their houses and move to some place where they don't think there's fracking, or start paying the, the company that owns the water wells or uh, owns the pipeline that will be piping in fresh, clean water from somewhere else that's uncontaminated, pay them whatever they want. There's been massive revolts in other countries uh, when corporations like Enron had a big uh, debacle, I think back around 2001 or 2002, before they went bankrupt, Enron uh, struck a deal, I think it was in India, to privatize a uh, big municipal water system. And the water prices to the people after it was privatized, like what happened to our private uh, meters in Chicago here? Didn't the price of parking go up quite a bit after this system was privatized? Does anybody yes. know about that? Yes. That's not a debatable issue, is it? Everybody pretty knows that we're getting uh, hosed by that company that uh, bought our uh, rights to our parking meters. Well, that's what privatization is. You buy a public resource that used to be run for the public good, and then you simply give it to private billionaire predators and let them start charging whatever the market will bear. It's not what, what the, what the you know, if they could, they could sell water for, uh, you know, 10 cents a gallon, if that's what it costs them to produce it, they're not going to sell it for 10 cents a gallon, it would be 50 cents a gallon, or a dollar. Like the, the, the drug companies have, have pioneered this technique. A lot of people are very, very envious of the pharmaceutical industry, because they can make a bottle of pills for 11 cents and sell it for $300. And the cost, the cost of the manufacturing has nothing to do 
with the end use. It's just simply privatization, maximizing profits for uh, the maximum gain. And when you're dealing with billionaire predators, like I'm talking about here, there's no upper limit. There, there's no there's no limit to their greed. Uh, a billion is never enough. When they reach a billion, then they go for the second, then they go for the third, and we have we've shoveled more money uh, the United States you know since 2000 the, the period between 2000 2001 and 2009 the, the Bush Cheney years was the greatest most successful corporate welfare system welfare for the rich that's ever been run on planet earth anywhere in the history of the human race they transferred more trillions into fewer bank accounts in the shortest amount of time than has been seen in any country in history ever, you know, adjusting for inflation and everything else. The Bush Cheney administration was wildly successful. We had criminals running wild for eight solid years, and we, we voted for a change in 2008, didn't we, a lot of us? Well, we didn't know that we were going to get, we're in our fifth year of extension of Bush Cheney crimes against humanity on these issues we're talking about. And I, I was suspicious uh, after a month or two. I thought, when, when are the new Democratic appointees going to come in? You know, you have 2,000 people appointees running the government, and when, when we changes from Republican to Democrat, it's always in the past. Well, everybody from the party that lost, they got pink slips, and you had a whole bunch of new people come in from your own party to run the government. Well, that didn't happen with Obama. He just simply kept the whole Bush Cheney infrastructure, and there we are. When, and understanding this, is the key to understanding what these companies are doing. Language matters. You know, when somebody tells you that fracking is totally safe, it doesn't pollute the groundwater, and especially if it's an executive from a fracking company that has some kind of experience, he's not his first day on the job, if he says, uh, well, there's no problem, like in a debate, well, there's no problem, and then you try to list the problems. Is well, my opponent is uninformed. Well, no, that man is not expressing uh, uh, an undocumented opinion. He's flat out lying. There. Where's that book? You got that red book. The two books that are listed on the screen flyer: the benefits of fracking. Uh, with the bottom of that first side, where we're talking about who benefits, the predators, it comes out of this book, Predator Nation, that was published in late 2012 or 2013. It's, it's Predator Nation by Charles H. Ferguson, and it's called Corporate Criminals, Political Corruption, and the Hijacking of America. America has been whole, totally hijacked by corporate predators, and we, language matters. We have to speak in those terms. When there's a, there's a book called The Skull of York. Let's see if I can find it. Eric Larson. Eric Larson, who he published this book in uh, I think it was 2011. It's called. Um, this is 2011. It's a whole bunch of stories. It's, it's called The Skull of York, The Emptiness of American Thinking in a Time of Great Peril. It describes how our media, especially the left-wing media, acting as gatekeepers. That's Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! Uh, Matthew Rothschild from The Nation, The Progressive, a whole bunch of left-wing people are doing the equivalent of what I said. It's like a sportscaster from Chicago that lived in Chicago for 20 years giving you a history of the Chicago Bulls and claiming he never heard of Michael Jordan. Could you give a history of the Bulls without Michael? Baseball without Babe Ruth. The Vatican without the Pope. The, the left-wing media talks about all kinds of problems, but the one thing they don't talk about, and there's copies enough here for everybody, is what's called the source of the dark force. The source that's driving the billionaire predators, giving them the power 
to maintain this myth. The source of the dark force of the neocon program is the event we call 9-11, the myth of 9-11. And this, this article was written by David Kubiak from uh, Project Censored in about 2005. I wrote the article on the back called Crossing the Threshold in October of 2005. It's like eight years ago. If people would cross the threshold early and face a problem without pretending it doesn't exist, if people cross the threshold early in a case of wife abuse or child abuse, how many lives could be saved? if people would face the problem early rather than pretending, well, I don't think anything bad's going on. I don't want to think about that. Or, or, you know, the case of serial killers living next door. People, well, he's such a nice boy, I can't believe anything bad would be going on. If people would look at evidence when they have it and follow the leads in real time, these things are easy to understand. It's the, only, the only way... Charlie? Is that thing got... Yeah. What changed? Nothing. Okay. The idea is all of these different authors are saying the same thing. They're, they're saying basically America has to start with simple facts that you can understand. You know, wake up yourself, face the reality of it, get comfortable with talking about it, and help your friends and neighbors learn. It's called the Galileo learning curve. In Galileo's time, they didn't have phones, no television, no internet, no radio, no electricity. They simply, to learn anything, you had to walk over to somebody's house and talk to them, have a cup of coffee or something. Well, on the blacked out subjects in America, that's how the knowledge is spreading. It's like, you know, Galileo was first and he got arrested. But people came along behind him with telescopes and said, hey, he was right. So. People are, we have 5% of the world's people here. The rest of the world is showing us the way. And you know, there's massive protests going on in Canada about the XL pipeline, the Keystone XL pipeline. That's a pipeline from Canada from the tar sands to you know, bring the, this fracked oil and gas and everything through America to a port down by the Gulf of Mexico. And, and refine it and sell it to foreign countries. They're just doing it for the money. We do not need the energy. The, part of the problem is, as I mentioned, I didn't mention earlier, um, in high places, you know, the Republican Party has a massive backing and support of, of fundamentalist Christian churches that teach the end time is here. The, the, in 1987, they were actually teaching that nuclear war is God's plan for America and that the environment will get a whole new planet when Jesus returns, but this one has to be destroyed first. Well, a, a woman called... Uh, For those of you that are interested in, in religious or Christian history, you might be interested in looking up a copy of this book in the library. It's called The Rapture Exposed, The Message of Hope in the Book of Revelations. And her whole thesis, basically, what this book is about, says right there on page 20, said the rapture, the, the concept of the rapture that's talked about in these Christian churches, was invented 170 years ago. There's no word for the rapture or its concept anywhere in the Bible, the, uh, the older Bibles. The rapture concept is new, and it's not part of The author of that book is Barbara R. Rossing, and it's a fascinating book if you want to understand how churches are able to totally close people's mind and get them moving forward in tunnel vision saying, oh well, you're going to heaven in the rapture, so don't worry about the pollution. Don't worry about uh, your kids getting sick. And don't worry about this or that. Don't have any long-term goals. Don't fight the oil companies that are destroying the mountaintops. Because we're going to get a whole new planet when Jesus returns. A segment of the American public believes that crap. I call it cribs. Cribs is a short C-R-I-B-S. That's criminally insane bullshit. Cribs, a giant load of cribs. 
and I have a friend that uh, when, when he's having a discussion with somebody, he'll just say, time out, time out, that's a load of cribs. And his friend says, what do you mean cribs? Well, he says, well, it's criminally insane bullshit you're giving me. And if we don't confront this kind of cribs, criminally insane bullshit, in real time when everything's happening, then you can't, you can't change or defeat the process. It doesn't do you any good to find out five years later that your child was murdered by a doctor that was paid to prescribe a new medicine. You need to know, you know, if your child is getting sicker and sicker on a drug, you have to ask, should I get a second opinion? Uh, the American Medical Association has done a great job keeping this knowledge, and that we could talk for days on that subject too, of all, Mike Papantonio talks about the concept of don't take any new drug. All these new drugs, these big money makers that are advertised on television that are brand new, he said, they have side effects. And the, you know, the, the drug companies say, well, only one out of 200 is going to have a fatal heart attack. The, the drug's going to benefit the other 199, so one out of 200 isn't bad. Well, if, if there's 200 drugs on the market, your chances are getting better and better of having a side effect. And the you know they like it says down there at the bottom, the you know the uh, the common <clears throat> the common thread. If they don't express it in so many words, well, some of them having cocktail parties, they'll they'll say it in private. These big companies will constantly say, well. We're sorry that people are killed by our process, but you have to realize it's not personal. It's not that we want to kill those people, it's just they're standing in the way of profits. You know, it's just going for the money is, that's our, our duty is to the shareholders to maximize the profits. And if a few people have to die in the process, well, it is just good business. That's where we are in America. If you go over to Europe and try to run an HMO or a hospital like you run it here in America for profit, they just come out and arrest you. It's, America stands alone in, a, in running a for-profit system run by billionaire predators. That's why our medical care is so expensive on many different fronts. But the um, on the back of this flyer, take a, we'll take a look and we'll talk at this for a couple of minutes. Those of you, uh, there's a, something at the top. There's a that's a page. I just I simply I simply copied a page out of this book. Called this book that was published in 2006, it's called Energy Switch by Craig Morris. Proven Solutions for a Renewable Energy Future. This book is loaded with cheaper, safer, green alternatives to deep water drilling, fracking, nuclear power, coal, oil, gas, everywhere. This book was published in 2006. The things they were describing as cheaper and cleaner then have gotten cheaper and cleaner in the eight years, seven years since. You know, 2006, that's what, seven years ago. Uh, the price of solar has come down another 50%. The price of wind has dropped 50%. And that's, for those of you that, if you have your glasses on, you know, I'm sorry that the print is small, but uh, the, the big box chart shows how much solar radiation is coming in every day. We, 10, 10 to 12,000 times more light falls on the planet than what the human race uses. All we need to do is collect a fraction, one ten thousandth of the light, and we could run everything. Now on the left hand side there's wind, wind energy. You know, wind energy has a, a huge chunk, uh, many times more than what the human race uses every day. Ocean energy, uh, hydropower, uh, geothermal pipes that can be drilled down in the, uh, in, the, in the ocean, use cold water coming up, the temperature differential, or on land you can uh, drill down and, and get uh, run pipes down and uh, circulate uh, liquids. The temperature differential will run turbines and all kinds of things. So there's, there's a blend of all kinds of resources that are today vastly cleaner, safer, for the environment, they're cheaper than fracking or tar sands or drilling in the ocean. Uh, we have to wake up as a society, and waking up as a one one person at a time thing. I don't know how long it takes a person to wake up and just say, "Hey, that makes sense." 
but um, there's some articles back here also. Uh, I, I brought an article, so there's enough copies for most of you. If anybody wants it, it's like a 12-page article out of Discover Magazine of 2006. It's called The Energizer. Amory Lovins has a vision. This is Discover, uh, February Discover issue 2006. And it says, Amory Lovins has a vision. The U.S. economy keeps going and going and going without any oil. And without oil, gas, nuclear power, or any kind of polluting fossil fuel. The, the body of knowledge on the clean, safe, cheap, cheap alternatives has been huge for 20 years. But you see how the American media, if you have control of the media, total control, and you can sell a myth like 9-11 to the people in broad daylight when they, their, their eyes are showing that the buildings are going sideways, but the media are talking on TV saying, oh, the building's collapsing, the building's collapsing. If you have the ability to maintain people in a state of mythology on something that's as simple and easy to see in broad daylight, then there's no problem blacking out all the knowledge that we could be running cars for 100 miles per gallon, or we could be running cars on hydrogen, the fuel cells. The fuel cells have been around for quite a while. Uh, and they're, they're being used in other countries. There's, uh, France reportedly has a whole bunch of fleet of vehicles that they're running on with compressed air tanks. The engines run on compressed air, and then they just get the tank recharged, you know, periodically, uh, depending on how many miles you drive. But there's all kinds of alternatives. The, uh, the Currently, the college solution uh, they have a solar decathlon, uh, a solar bike contest, or a solar vehicle, electric vehicle contest. They're like bicycles powered by solar panels. And the current world record is something like, not the solar, the, the fuel. Uh, the gasoline record is over 1,000 miles per gallon. I think it's up around six to 8,000 miles a gallon. I haven't checked the latest this year. But the American companies, also, I fail to mention, um, to keep us dependent on oil and gas that we would get from fracking and everything else, they, they have suppressed the knowledge that glass and insulation will take the place of natural gas in houses. The houses in Schaumburg use less than one-tenth as much natural gas to heat the place as a normal house because the need for 90% of the gas burned per day has been replaced with better window glass and insulation that doesn't lose heat. Basically, in 1984, the house up in Colorado was built. They have no heating bill, 3,000 square foot house. There's no heating bill and a $5 a month electric bill for that place. Now they get a check back from the utility from their solar panels on the roof. But the idea that you need a furnace and that you need to burn natural gas for indoor human comfort, that idea has been obsolete since 1977. So this whole idea that we have to be fracking for gas everywhere because we need a lot of natural gas. It's one giant load of, what do we say? Cribs. Criminally insane bullshit. That's cribs. And we have to address it as a nation. And since it's not going to come from the top down, Obama is fully in the pocket of the billionaire predators. There's no debate on that anywhere now. Uh, the only debate you get is from people that are still thinking that he's a Democrat or thinking that the president has the real power to combat these billionaire predators. Uh, we need a grassroots movement in the country where millions of people get on the same page. Like millions of us accepted smoke-free restaurants. That's not a debatable issue anymore, right? 30 years ago, you get into a fist fight if you ask somebody to put off your cigarette next to you at a lunch counter. I got a God-given right to light up and puff away anywhere. Yeah. 30 years ago, not today, knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. Martin Luther King, one of the best quotes I like from Martin Luther King, came, for those of you that are interested in what's happening in the prison industrial complex and why our country has more incarcerated people than anywhere else on the planet, this is a book by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow. And it talks about the defunding of public housing and transferring those funds into building prisons. So the new public housing has bars on it. And they just arrest people and chuck them in there for a year or two and stamp them with a felony. And when they come out, 
They can't vote. You can just discriminate against them for the rest of their lives. You can't discriminate against somebody because they're a different skin color or race or religion, but you can discriminate if they're stamped with a felony. Mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness. That's what this book talks about. The new Jim Crow, and in, in, in this one, uh, Martin Luther King is quoted. I never heard this before I, I read this book. He said this, the most dangerous thing in all the world is sincere stupidity and conscientious ignorance. Sincere stupidity and conscientious ignorance. People mean well, but they're terrifyingly ignorant of the basic facts on the subject they're promoting. So, some uh, if, a couple months later, if there's an opening, uh, I, I'm going to volunteer to do another uh, program like this on the top ten blacked out subjects in America. We haven't done an update on a top ten in a long time. The new Censor News book from Project Censor, it's a paperback, a thick paperback about this size. It'll say Censored 2014. Comes out of Sonoma State. Every year it's published in November with the top 25 blacked out stories that would change our country overnight in a heartbeat if they were covered rather than blacked out. So a lot, of, most of the stuff we're talking about here tonight has been covered as, as a staple, ongoing co uh, coverage in Project Censored year after year over the last 30 years. Project Censored has been up and running for 30 years now, and last week we heard a fellow that has a degree in journalism, has been in the media for 10 years. He never heard of Project Censored or Sonoma State University. That's how successful the blackout is. I, as far as I can tell, that's the single most successfully blacked out book in America. From the size of the database relative to the knowledge, it, it's, it's basically it's like finding people that are Bulls fans and never heard of Michael because the radio announcer blacks it out. So we're about 9.15 now. I, I think it's about time. Hey, hold on a minute. I See if I had... Uh, Yeah, the, if you don't take away anything else from my, from my talk tonight, what I want to stress is you can log on to certain websites. I've got cards here with those sites. They have huge archives of like the Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Um, massive archives about what happened on 9-11. Project Censor has massive archives of their, their subjects going back 25 years of things that were blacked out. Common Dreams uh, website is one of the best for showing real news that's happening. They don't talk about 9-11, but they talk about almost everything else. A lot of the good articles I got on fracking show up on Common Dreams or the massive environmental archives on a website called Truthout. A Truthout run by William Rivers Pitt. William Rivers Pitt is a required uh, retired high school teacher. I, I believe this book is from, I pulled it off my shelf, yeah, it, it was printed in 2003, 10 years ago. And his comment is, you know, very much along the lines of Martin Luther King. The title of it is, The Greatest Sedition is Silence. And uh, Sir Thomas More from England said that in his great speech. The maximum of the law is silence means consent. If you're silent about something, it means you consent. You're going along with it. If you don't speak up and oppose it, if you're silent, silence means consent. That's what the law means. So um, there's all kinds of beneficial things happening all over the world. If we tell people about it, don't remain silent. Learn about some good thing and pass it on. That's what I do talking to people at the gas station or uh, Target, wherever, I'm, wherever I am. I'm constantly asking people, did you know this? Are you familiar with that website? Just strike up a conversation and have what we call a Galileo seminar for two minutes. You know, give people a website or a card because there's, uh, we can change things, you know, 90, Maybe some of you are aware that 90%, 95% of the emails and calls our senators and congressmen have been getting in the last week is in opposing any expanded war in Syria. The country is sick of this. I mean, the, the country has reached 
the level of disgust they reached in 2008 with the Bush Cheney corporate criminal machine. And we need to speak up forcefully. Okay? So let's uh, open it up to questions. All right. <laughs> I see Sid Cohen here, right yeah, there, right um, and Gary You mentioned the Amy yeah, Goodman okay. and the Progressive oh, magazine, oh, oh, but you never uh, told us about it. Oh, uh, there's a chapter. Yeah, the question was, I mentioned Amy Goodman and uh, Progressive magazine. Um, The, um, the progressives, the progressives are doing the equivalent of a sheriff sitting back in his office when people bring him evidence that there's a serial killer on the loose and they know where the guy lives, they know where he works, and the sheriff says, well, yeah, I don't, that's not enough evidence for me. Um, there's chapters Chapter 5 is called Our Enemies, The Left Gatekeepers. Chapter 6 is called The Left Gatekeepers, Part 2. Part 3 is Chapter 7. In here he refers to a guy named, uh, the last name was Quisling. And a Quisling in, in World War II, it was his famous quote, uh, Quisling means somebody that consorts with the enemy or, or supports what the enemy is doing. Well, he's tough on the left. He says the left wing, they report, they protest all kinds of things that are detrimental to the middle class, but they're not going after, they don't mention, in fact, they won't allow anybody on their shows that talks about the core issue, the driving force, which is the myth of 9-11. That's why he calls these people the left wing gatekeepers. Okay? Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> The big issue of our time right now is a possible conflict with Syria. What's the rush to get in there? Is this possibly uh, pipeline rounds? Yeah, he said, yeah, yeah the, the rush to get into Syria. Syria is the next, probably the next customer on that classified list of the Project for a New American Century I've talked about. They said we can transform the governments of seven countries in five years. But they got slowed down. We, we got back, bogged down in Afghanistan. We got really bogged down in Iraq. And the, the troops are coming home from Iraq educating the public that Iraq is un uninhabitable for humans. Women over there are giving birth to all kinds of deformed dead babies because of the depleted uranium dust. That country is contaminated with fine uranium dust from the depleted uranium bunker buster bombs, tank shells. Afghanistan and Iraq have been considered uninhabitable for humans since 2005. There's still people living in those countries thinking they're going to be able to live there, but you know it's hard for people to recognize that our homeland, our home, our country has been destroyed, and we got to move. So uh, those are two big blacked-out issues. That in Syria is just now you know the, the the pipeline route has been pretty much completed in Afghanistan. Iraq is occupied by the four big military bases, so it's time to move on to Syria. And uh, there's some oil-rich uh, deposits down in Yemen, uh, or in and around there. That's one of the strategic ones also. So that's why we're hearing about these uh, terrorist activities that we have to go quell in these countries. And uh, of course, several countries have published people that I have friends on the ground in Syria think that that chemical attack was a false flag attack like 9-11 was a false flag in our country to stir up the population and make it look like some big disaster is happening, now we have to go after the people that did it. Okay? So um, study as much as you can on Syria and uh, make calls, phone, uh, emails to the White House, call your senators and congressmen, just be vocal. Don't sit back quiet and let it happen without at least voicing uh, opposition. Does that make any sense? Okay, who's next? Karen Holman. Karen? Yeah. First of all, I actually would, would agree with you that the president recognizes overt hypocrisy. And my argument back to you, and the question I would agree with you, is that 
uh, part of insiders uh, have identified that organizing for action, not whether I'm in it or not, is really the true gist of what people like Liz Warren are looking for. People who believe that we have to go back to representative public. Can you give us a commentary on that? And furthermore, democracy now, there's some articles this week that are right down there for you work that second what you're saying by Robert White. So Robert like, White? Robert Wright. Right. Oh, Robert Wright. Okay. So, so there's a lot of insiders so saying don't move money to, to uh, act blue, move money to the issues campaign because it'll keep people you have in like your senator. What your, your question is, is we should stress don't don't support the Democratic Party blindly uh, or just support issues. People are working on issues it. instead. Correct. But however, on a, on a, the only know. thing positive I've spent this it, year, if you look at what's happening in New York City, okay. and if you look at places where we've been able to support people Thanks, against under one corporate money, there might be some glimmer of hope. And so I, I do want oh, people to understand question. that we did win in areas where there's time to one against this with money with critical mass. So this, this lady, she just money. made a comment that there is all kinds of hopeful things going on that you won't hear about in the corporate media. And the banksters are all up in arms about a program. Uh, municipalities are uh, beginning to use the concept of eminent domain to reclaim houses underwater and let people that are living in them <coughs> buy them back for the current value, of, you know, so that you're not evicting for people from homes. There's something called a rolling jubilee, where they're buying up uh, distressed mortgages or they're buying up student debt, and then just writing it off and uh, telling the student your, your debt's been paid off, you're not a slave anymore. There's creative things like what she just talked about. There's a bunch of creative things going on all over this country, but it, it's not in the mainstream media. Right. Who's next? Travis. Uh, <clears throat> you say that uh, Syria is filled with radioactive dust. Not Syria, uh, right. Afghanistan and Iraq, where we've been bombing. Oh, but not Syria. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, Syria so could become a radioactive wasteland if we go in there with cruise missiles and everything else that have depleted uranium in them. My question is, could a lot of money be made by fracking in Syria? No, they don't. Uh, I don't think. No. I don't, I'm not sure, but I haven't heard that. The question was, can a lot of money be made by fracking in Syria? No, I think the money would be made in Syria is taking over and getting a friendly government that will allow us to help control the oil fields. There's massive oil over there, no, not, not, not natural. In Syria. Not in Well, but not in Syria, but in around the area. Syria is, has strategic uh, location for other things. That, that's why uh, you'd have to study more. I, I have not studied a lot on Syria, so I can't speak to that. I could maybe in a month if I study it more. On, uh, but see, the, it hasn't been going on for years. We're just now hearing about Syria. People are just digging in, uh, into it with research and stuff over the last few weeks. And we have a huge public outcry from just a few, few weeks of Obama well, you know, they're preparing us for attack in Syria the way they prepared us for Afghanistan right after 9-11. That's what's going on. All right, Kathy Paul. Um, could you repeat again about 9-11 and what happened that day about the planes flying in the buildings and just, you know, whatever, what, the way they set it up? You know, the, the inside job oh, uh, the question was, could I repeat, uh, summarize really quickly about what happened on 9-11 again? Yeah, the 30-second summary is the buildings were prepped weeks or months in advance with explosives. The media was given the script to read as the events were happening that day. So the media had the script. So they weren't reporting just offhand. Some people stepped out of line and reported what they actually saw, but that was overridden by the editing of the tape. They had actors on the ground that were uh, promoting the original, the media script, while people that reported controlled demolitions, uh, they were, re you know, they, they reported it, but that tape was edited out of uh, existence by nine o'clock that night. So they had the script, uh, two planes flew into the towers to start some smoke and mirrors like the magician, then the explosives were triggered and the twin towers were converted to dust and spread over lower Manhattan as a cloud of dust. And then seven hours later, building seven, the 47-story building, was brought down smoothly with a controlled demolition after 
all the people in the area had been pulled back and evacuated by the police and the firemen. They had prior knowledge of it. Does that answer your question really quick? Yeah. I've got uh, other stuff up here that describes this for you. Yeah, there's papers up here. If anybody wants anything on that, come up and see me later after after the talk is over. John Ritchie. Okay. Um, this is kind of related to what Kathy was just asking about. Uh, you're, you're, this uh, theory that you've just said that the uh, that the twin towers were pulverized <coughs> and the dust was 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 scattered sideways that the build and you know just uh, that there were, the buildings did not uh, collapse and then you also claim that Osama bin Laden worked for the CIA until until September 10th 2001 and. Then he went into hiding. Right, right, right. What's your question, right, right, right. Okay, okay. This is, let me, let me, let me, okay, I, that's, okay, this is what, you know, where, where are you getting, where are you getting these theories from? Okay, Don asked, uh, where am I getting the theory that the two twin towers went sideways in the wind as a cloud of dust? That's not a theory, that's the result of the forensic evidence, the lab results published by thousands of scientists from all over the world. There are pictures of no rubble pile on the ground under where the two twin towers were. The firefighters came out, after each building so-called collapsed, they're looking and says, where's the building? Where's the rubble? When a building comes down in a controlled demolition, you get a big pile of rubble. The, the pile of rubble was only 5% of what it should be if the building collapsed. The other 95% was converted to dust in the air before anything hit the ground. The dustification of the two twin towers occurred in the air and created this big cloud of hot, like volcanic dust that just drifted sideways in the cloud of wind. That's an established fact. That's not a theory. That that's a fact. Period. So uh, you know, it's a fact that the third building was brought down by a controlled demolition no. and reported that way. Those are facts now that have been established by crime scene investigation type labs all over the world. Oh, okay, then why is the, if this is a fact, then why, um, is, this is, why is this not, I mean, it isn't just that the U.S. government is not acknowledged, it's not just that the U.S. government is, is not saying this, it's also that even a lot of 9-11 truthers don't agree with what you've just said. What is your question again? Why okay. is it not being reported? Yeah, I mean, you're calling this a fact, but I'm afraid that there's an awful lot of people... Let me, let me, uh, okay, that, let me give that, you an answer to this. I mean, you know, you, you're... The, the U.S. got first, to, for, for starters, it's just, let's just say the U.S. government, but second of all, there's even a lot of truthers that don't that don't uh, agree with your interpretation of events. You, you have to what understand, you there are, there are so-called 9-11 truth groups that are doing the same job that the Warren Commission did with the Kennedy assassination. Their, their job is to pr promote the official theory and keep people off the trail of the published forensic evidence. And the fact that this is not in the news is because we have laws in this country, and people understand that there, virtually every law office in the country, sheriff's office, understands that there's no statute, there's no statute of limitations on murder, Don. Nine, uh, 3,000 people were murdered by our own people. Okay. And if you acknowledge that, then you have to say, why don't we go after, you have, if you acknowledge what I just told you, then you also have to say who had the means, motive, and opportunity to do this. And this is described in this book. Now. You, you haven't addressed my question about Osama bin Laden. And you're, you said oh. that he was working for the CIA until, right up until the day before 9-11. And, um, uh, that research, where did you hear that, did that you research hear that? is in a bunch of different books uh, that talk about the history of Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. But it's specifically in a book written by Professor David Ray Griffin uh, called Osama bin Laden Dead or Alive. Uh -huh. Professor Griffin reports that Osama bin Laden was widely acknowledged in the Middle East to have died in December 13th, 2001, and they reported his funeral in 2001. So we've been living with the myth, the legend of Osama bin Laden and the fake videotapes and the Osama look-alike actors for 12 years. And that's why President Obama 
decided, well, we've got to go kill Osama and just throw the bind overboard and then that's it. Because the knowledge has spread so far worldwide that outside the United States, you have no credibility claiming Osama bin Laden's alive. Everybody knows he died in December of 2001. That's common knowledge all over, knows that? all over the world. Everybody Not everybody here. I'm talking about people in the Middle East, people in Germany, people in Europe where the news hasn't been suppressed. Now, the people in Britain are probably in the dark because Britain is lockstep with America on these things. But you get to look at the foreign press and what's coming out of foreign sources. There's there's no debate on this. This is uh, is, is established. But we're still we're still riding the myth of Osama oh, bin Laden. This is established around the world. Yes. Jeff. Okay. As long as we're on 9/11, I want to, my question pertains to another aspect of it, namely the Pentagon taking it. What do you know about the availability of Stinger missiles? in the end times of the Pentagon, such that they could have brought down whatever the hell it was that was headed toward the Pentagon. Uh, the question was, what do we know about what might have happened, what kind of missiles might hit, hit the Pentagon? No, no, the missiles, Stinger missiles, surface-to-air missiles, that could have knocked down whatever airplane it oh. was that was going towards the Pentagon. The Stinger I, missiles did. Uh, aren't the, the missile batteries on the roof of the Pentagon? There may be here? two. I don't know. I'm just what, no, so well, okay. what missiles, Stinger or otherwise, were available to knock that plane down? And insofar as there were missiles available to knock the plane down, why didn't they do it? Well, okay, it's a two-part. Why, why, why didn't the missiles? The Pentagon is considered the most effectively defended building on the planet. And the White House is another effectively defended building. They have Stinger missiles they can shoot at incoming aircraft. Well, the bits and pieces, as people are reaching the end of their careers, and they're not afraid of getting fired uh, or getting killed so much, because there's... They're not afraid of speaking out like they were in September of 2001. If you spoke out right after 9-11, you run the very real risk of having a car accident or a freak bathtub accident or electrocution or something like that. A lot of people were killed, eyewitnesses, right after 9-11. So that silenced others. So the what... Uh, as I said, military people that worked in the Pentagon are speaking out now that they were there, they were in their offices when they heard the bombs go off initially in the Pentagon. The Pentagon was internally bombed before whatever flew into the side of the building made that hole in the side. Hey, Jeff, are you still listening? Uh, so the reason that the Stinger missiles on the roof weren't activated to shoot down what flew into the side of the Pentagon is there's a rel there's a consensus among hundreds of thousands of, of groups including thousands of pilots Air, commercial pilots are saying there's no way in the world that any kind of big commercial airliner would have made that small hole in the side of the Pentagon whatever hit the Pentagon was something small and fast moving like one of our cruise missiles and uh, they immediately confiscated all the videos at the gas station across the street in the hotel. Any videos, cameras that had a view of the Pentagon, the FBI was there. They knew what was going to happen at 932. Two minutes later, they walked into the gas station and confiscated the videotape right after the hit on the Pentagon before anybody had time to even look at the tape. If they had the script in advance. They knew where they had to be to, whisk, to confiscate the tapes made by eyewitnesses. That's why no tape has ever been released of a big airliner of any kind running in the side of the Pentagon. But if you're interested on this, look onto a site called Pilots for 9-11 Truth. They have debunked every single piece of what we were told about the four aircraft flying around on 9-11. All four stories are thought to be mythology. And some, something else happened. What about the Stingers specifically? Well, I think the, uh, there was a stand down on 9-11. The head of the military, the military stood down and they did not fire, they did not get any orders to fire at any aircraft until after the events of 9-11 were over. And then we went back to normal when the generals or anybody else locally has the ability to shoot at an aircraft that's threatening a big, you know, a town or whatever it is, okay? The, the normal operating procedure of defending America against terrorist threats, those procedures were all shut down on the morning of 9-11.
to uh, supposedly, you know, allow the attack to happen. Do you have squeals who were in the Pentagon saying this? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Come see me afterwards if you want any information on that. I can give you the, the sources of where the, you know, the, the information on the Pentagon is. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, what's your view uh, on you? The gas from oh, Friday. Wait a uh, he could get the flow because you just uh, answered, uh, uh, yeah, the question I wanted to ask. I'm an on, uh, uh, honorable discharged <coughs> veteran from the Army, and I was a missile man at Fort Bliss, Texas. <coughs> Defense, we shoot that things in there. But if you, didn't, you said to him, you don't have to repeat it no more, but my question was going to be, why don't you say something about it? Why, why didn't we get defended on 9-11? Why there was no visible defense? All these things were happening, and uh, our, our Army and Navy or Air Force weren't fighting back, right? They weren't shooting. Well, that's because in July of 2001, after they had been in office a few years, a few months, the Bush-Cheney regime changed the normal operating military procedure for defending against off-course airliners or hijacked airliners. They, uh, the local, the FAA was supposed to send orders to the nearest military base and notify them. Well, the FAA had one of the compliant criminals in charge that day, and he didn't do anything. The head of the military command out at NORAD and a couple other bases, they were also insiders, part of the project for a new American century. So they were away from their offices for a couple of hours when anybody was seeking permission to respond to the emergency. You know, and then after 9-11, the rules were changed back the way they always were. If you can't get permission from this guy, go right on the next one or, or, or make the order yourself. You know, if, if the general is in the bathroom and he can't be located, then it doesn't mean that we can't defend America, right? So only during the period of 9-11 were these rules of engagement temporarily suspended. And then we're back to normal now. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I wanted yeah. you to come in. You did it nicely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Job lawyer, Gabriel. Gabriel? No. Gabriel. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, if this was in fact a conspiracy on 9-11, hundreds and even thousands of people were involved, you know, there's an old saying, if two people know a secret, it's no longer a secret. Well, now you're saying that uh, hundreds or thousands of people are keeping a secret. I, and none have come forward. I find that hard to believe. Thank you. Uh, you know, the question was, uh, how, is, how can we believe that hundreds of thousands of people are keeping a secret and nobody has come forward? Well, they have come forward, sir. They're being, they're being interviewed in cameras and on TV and radio shows all over the planet. There's Americans that were witnesses here that go to France or Venezuela and Germany and the Guardian in England, they, they give reports. It's being reported all over the world. These people aren't silent. All of this tape and knowledge is seamlessly blacked out by the American media. And the American media, if you try to talk about what we're talking about here, you try to talk about this on American television, the station manager, there, you know, somebody's near the red button to cut the television feed off. They dive for the red button, cut the picture off, and go to a commercial, and then they walk over and fire the reporter that had the audacity to try to interview you or me or any other eyewitness that wants to talk about this on the airways. That's how it's silenced in America. They're not silent. There's hundreds of books, thousands of reports. This is this is common knowledge all over the world. What we're talking about. Okay. Russell Johnson and then uh, Diane Lubavis. You what's mentioned two big on, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. You, What's your view on using this natural gas from uh, fracking or other sources as a transportation fuel, basically the Pickens plant? Oh. You ask what's, what's my view of using frack natural gas as a transportation fuel? Yes, which is the Pickens plant. The T Boone's Pickens plant. Well, Pickens is, you have to realize who he is. He's a Texas oil man that's in it for the money. Big money. There's big money involved to be made in uh, getting oil out of certain areas where you don't have to pay for the environmental devastation. 
if you just you know frack that area and take the gas and then move on, oh no, it appears to be a cheap source of natural gas. But if you add up the real cost of this to the environment and everything else, then other forms of natural gas from other sources would be cheaper and cleaner. But in any case, making car engines more efficient with what we know now, if they just started selling high efficiency vehicles in America, we have some vehicles made in America that get 75 miles to the gallon, but they're not sold in America. They're shipped overseas. They've been making 75 to 100 mile per gallon vehicles all over the world for the last 20 years. They know how to do it, and this would eliminate the need for most natural gas. You could begin running fleets on hydrogen. There's, there's all kinds of alternative fuels that can take the place of natural gas. Biofuels, uh, that's a whole other subject. We could talk about that for two hours some other day. If you want to uh, do some research, why don't you do a presentation on that some night about the, the alternative fuels for transportation. I, we'd be more than happy to welcome the presentation. And most of that is going to the fueling the big rigs, what you talked about. Um, big, uh, believe it or not, Walmart uh, is rumored to have bought a fleet of hybrids that get 40% better gas mileage. Uh, they can make hybrid trucks and hybrid vehicles that get 50-60% better mileage, just like the hybrid cars but you have to go into mass production to keep the price down. There's a log on, my, my, my answer to you for your question would be log on to Rocky Mountain Institute. It's rmi.org and look at their transportation section. They have all kinds of examples of things that are going on all over the world that address the specific question you asked, okay? Do I have all the Okay, Andy, there's something I don't understand about it while you're talking about the whole 9 you said that these people, these 19 people who supposedly flew the planes into the building were phony. So then who flew the planes into the hotel? The, uh, the question back there was, uh, she just asked the question of uh, who flew the planes into the towers if it wasn't the 19 hijackers who are suspected that the hijackers were never even on the planes. Uh, the pilots for 9-11 Truth have produced a large amount of information and data and analysis of the radar tracings, and they show that the, the two flights that hit the towers and also the one in Pennsylvania, uh, but especially the two that hit the towers, uh, the two planes that hit the towers uh, were showing all the evidence of being flown on a very accurate military GPS that can maintain, the autopilot can maintain a sweeping curve at a certain angle to hit an object without missing it by 10 feet on either side. They, uh, the pilots for 9-11 Truth uh, have five DVDs you can order and more on the way showing that the, the, especially the two planes that were flown into the towers they think weren't flown by human pilots, that the planes, they were either drones painted to look like big American, you know, United planes, they were either big drones or they were taken over, the pilots' controls were simply disabled and the computer controls uh, flew on autopilot GPS that was, a lot of commercial airliners were equipped with that technology in early 2000. So the military had been practicing with all these things for several years and they had uh, they had a plane that flew successfully over the Atlantic and made the landing uh, totally computer controlled with no input from a human pilot. So that's that's what the theory, uh, most of the evidence is beginning to show. Uh -huh. What happened to the well, it's hard to track that because uh, two of the planes, the uh, two of the planes had tail numbers. Uh, the two that were supposed to hit the towers, I think, I think those two were reported as still being in service four years later uh, by researchers. Uh, but you know, the physicists for 9/11 Truth, they reported in 2005. They said with their investigation, they said the events of 9/11 involved pre-placed explosives, controlled demolition, and aircraft substitution. That's why there was no investigation of the aircraft parts supposedly in the rubble on 9-11. Anywhere. Okay, but then the people who were supposedly on the flight, 
they actually killed that. You know, the, the, the people who were. What happened to the passengers? Well, uh, some people believe the, the, the pa well the passengers, if they were on the flights, they were killed in the towers. If they weren't on the flights, then they were on, offloaded onto another plane, probably Flight 93, in, as it landed in Cleveland, and then took off. The, all four planes supposedly took off with very light loads, and there are reports. It's hard to verify. But reports are coming out that all four planes basically landed in Cleveland and the passengers were all loaded onto one plane and then other planes took off and hit the towers. Uh, in, in, a, in a radar dead zone, aircraft were switched. But that's, see, uh, the 9-11 Truth Movement is, um, they're allowing people to argue over these fine points when the reality is, Osama didn't do it. The hijackers didn't do it. This was an inside job prepped months in advance by corporate billionaire predators and their hired demolition companies and contractors and military mercenaries and everybody uh, that could orchestrate an event like this because the head of the German intelligence agency said on the night of 9-11, he said, what was done in America, what they're reporting, could not have been done without the smoothly hand-in-glove coordination of the people in the media, the air traffic controllers, the police, the head of the firefighting departments, everybody that were eyewitnesses that saw that the official story during the day, they said the official story is a crock, cribs, criminally insane bullshit. If any one of them stepped out of line, Humpty Dumpty would have come down crashing off the wall in a day. So that, that tells you how coordinated the whole thing was. So are you saying then that No, no, we're saying 3,000 Americans were murdered. We just don't know the location where they were murdered. They were either murdered somewhere else in another plane crash that was never reported, or in the, who knows. A lot of people died in the towers. They were converted to dust along with the concrete and the steel and the, you know, the glass, the desk, plastic. You know, everything in the towers was converted to dust along with a whole bunch of bodies. All right, Charlie, do you have a question? No, no, I... I'll just absorb all this. Um, <laughs> Gene Olin. There, there is one inside interest here which has nothing to do with conspiracy theories. We lost Dr. Jonathan Wright. Dr. Jonathan Wright is one of the most foremost physicians for social responsibility doctors who was killed this is a on an air crash coming show. down because Dr. Jonathan Wright speaks out very clearly against corporatocracy and the black box was not found. Where was he killed? Where, when, where and when, do you know? He went down over 10 years ago with WHO people that wanted us to cooperate more in the world to stop the biohazards like HIV. And, and Dr. Jonathan Wright went square against our corporate press and through the pharma. We did not find the black box. And so I, I, I hate to say that yes. because I don't think like that, but once you start to hear some of these leaders that are killed, we do have to wonder. A bunch of people were killed in the biological community right after 9/11. Right after the anthrax letters were mailed, the people that had, ex you know, the anthrax letters were mailed to the two Democratic senators that had told Dick Cheney they wanted to read the Patriot Act before they passed it. Boom! They get anthrax letters in the mail a couple of three, four days later, and then the rest of the Congress just laid down flat on the floor and let the criminals roll over them for six solid years because they knew, they said, we're not dealing with congressmen here, we're dealing with criminals masquerading as our elected politicians. And not only are they criminals, they're killers. We're dealing with killers that are running our Senate and Congress. And nothing with, Paul Wellstone was considered the conscience of the Senate. His plane was shot down 10 days before the election and the FBI knew where it was going down. They, they were, their office was an hour drive away from where that plane went down, but they were there. They were near the crash site within like 10 to 15 minutes. They roped it off. There was no investigation, couldn't find the black box. The FBI has been heavily involved in these cover-up of these crimes for the last 30 years. Okay? Tim? Okay, Andy. You know, over the last 70 years or so, maybe the last hundred, generally people are getting a little bit more wealthier. Generally the world has been improving quite a bit because of the spread of globalization. Can you comment or do you agree or disagree 
I'd just like to hear your fundamental views on globalization and uh, capitalism. Oh, he asked for that. <clears throat> that would be a subject for another half this, hour talk. But uh, the fundamentally, a lot of economists um, are pointing to Alan's Greenspan's comment uh, before Congress. And they ask him what went wrong with the banking crisis. You know, what's went, gone wrong? And he said, well, there appears to be a flaw in my economic model. Unregulated capitalism will get bigger and bigger like a cancer, a big cancerous tumor, it'll finally kill the host. Unregulated capitalism is recognized now to be detrimental to uh, the human population on planet Earth. And I can point you to 10 or 20 good books on the subject, but uh, globalization is something else. People trading, if you're getting, if you're manufacturing a product, like we used to have factories, if you're manufacturing something, sell it to another country, they can manufacture, sell it to us. That's a good thing. Global trade among more or less equal partners with, with people that aren't in slave labor camps making the stuff, if they are getting a fair price for their product, we're paying a fair wage to our workers like we used to in union factories here in this country, then globalization is a great thing. And yes, Buckminster Fuller in 1984 wrote a book called Critical Path. He said, you know, the, the rate of human uh, prosperity is expanding. He said, we have the means and the know-how to feed, clothe, and house everybody on the planet at a decent standard of living. But you can't do it when you're taking the wealth of 10,000 people at a time and shoving it in the bank account of one rich bastard that is filthy rich beyond their dreams. A fellow that has 22 million in the bank didn't work for that money. He's part of a system that raped and pillaged the middle class and the workers to amass that kind of wealth. And that's the fundamental issue that Americans, um, more and more people are coming to grips with it. And incidentally, I'll make a prediction for those of you that want to write it down, look toward next summer about this time after the generation of high school graduates next year and the generation of college graduates next year all graduate in May and June and they come home to live with mom and dad because there's no jobs in America for them. One more generation piled onto the generations now that are living at home with mom and dad or, or working at McDonald's for eight dollars an hour, that's going to push, I think, America will reach critical mass on this issue, on unregulated capitalism and unregulated globalization right. sometime next summer. Uh, Charlie Paydock has last question. All right. Yeah. Uh, Andy, you recommended everybody. this book about the 19 people uh, involved in 9-11. But I looked at that book and the guy writes it and he says, these are people who are most likely to be involved. Well, either they're involved or they're not. What's your question, Charlie? What? Either or. Uh, what, do you have a question in there? What's this category of most likely? Well, I mean, a... after all these years, you don't know who did it. You just say you, you kind of have suspects who yeah. are like likely to have done it? Okay. I mean, uh, is there a thing in our courts? You guys are cops. Where's that other cop? Uh, if the other policeman would tell you that in any crime, when a crime happens, the first thing you ask is who had means, motive, and opportunity. You start an investigation. The investigation was killed for 444 days, Bush and Cheney, Cheney went to Congress and said, we want no investigation of 9-11. It was a, a big uh, military media snafu that day. The air traffic controllers didn't communicate. Bah, it was a whole bunch of coincidences. Bad things happened and we were attacked by terrorists. But we don't want an investigation. Because if you investigate, you find out all these pieces like what I've told you. Now, the forensic investigation of what happened has been done. It's completed. We know that Al-Qaeda didn't do it. We know that the 19 hijackers, uh, eight of those pictures, uh, eight of those guys were giving interviews from the cab driver job they had in the Middle East or wherever they were. They weren't even on the planes. And there's no video footage in the airports of any of those 19 boarding those aircraft. 
it was a myth. But you start, as I said, you start with the three facts. Three buildings came down from two plane crashes. That's one fact. Two buildings went sideways in the wind as a cloud of dust. That wasn't done by plane crashes, period. No kind of plane crash can justify a building like that. Those are two basic facts. It's not Democrat or Republican or liberal or conservative. Those are two physical facts like, you know, you, and then the third one is, with those two, you know that Al-Qaeda didn't so do it. the bottom line is, you don't know who did it. No, we don't. We know who was in charge. We know who committed treason to cover it up. And those people should, those 19 here, the 19 listed here should all be in jail for the rest of their lives for treason. Even if, on, yeah, the, on, on the basis that they lied to us totally about what happened on 9-11. These people were in charge, in, in, the, in charge of the cover-up, and they were also in key positions to orchestrate the events. That's what police do. This is why the 9-11 movement is calling for a new investigation. Because there's no there's no time limit. There's no no time limit on um, murder. There's no, no statute of limitations. You can hunt people down 12 years later, 13 years after the evidence, uh, you get a sufficient evidence for an indictment. Now other countries, just to answer your question real quick, other countries are in, in various stages of process of swearing out arrest warrants for Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Rice. These people can't travel freely around the world. They'll get arrested and prosecuted as war criminals because of what they did in Iraq and Afghanistan, if not for what they did on 9-11. It's been one huge criminal conspiracy right. for 13 years. Thank you, Andy. Thank our speaker. Process. For the benefit of those who are a little new to our procedures, uh, we want to know how many people have rebuttals to make uh, or uh, comments. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, <laughs> no, make it four because there'll be more going. Right. Four, 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 and a four and a crack. And uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, speaker will have a at the end. Uh, uh, two I gotta stop, watch. It's the latest we have. Let's get going, there's an open mic. Uh, you can get in line here. Uh, I'm going to recognize Gene Anderson, who's the first lucky uh, rebutter. Mr. Anderson, speak. Gene uh, Anderson, yes. Uh, thanks for that. What's all the talk about? Okay, Gene, the mic, get it near you, get it near you. Uh, I, I mentioned the fact that I was uh, discharged under the from the army, and I was a missile man. In other words, aircraft defense, uh, that was a position that was 50 some years ago, so. <laughs> we, was, we was a defense uh, operation that we could shoot down, not on a plane, but we could shoot down rockets both before I got out. And I'd like to add, if anybody was in the military, and they finished their training, and you have, say, uh, what's all that talking for? All right, I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize. Get a room. <laughs> it's most likely my fault. Uh, if you were in the army, you know that you were well trained, at least back then. And I'm talking about in the 50s when I was there. You, you, you were trained, you knew exactly what you did. So I mentioned that to bring up to the, why didn't the button was hit and the planes take off and, and get whatever was up there that didn't have no business up there? Well, that's one thing you have to ask, why not? Then you see a building fall down because of the fire on it, or a plane hit it, you ask, why not? Then five hours later, another building fall down you ask why not? Because you would think that
that they would tell you about the third building like they told you about the first two buildings. Uh, 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 secondly, in my uh, company where we uh, fl uh, fl flow missiles, we also could control a plane. I, I don't, you know, if a plane was made the, the flap of, you know, with pilots, uh, uh, that ain't what I'm talking about. However, you could make a, a drum that looked just like a plane that you fly with a pilot. We could fly airplane without a pilot. That was back in the 50s. That's 50 some years ago. So don't rule that out either. That in the next uh, uh, question that always get me, who did it? Who care who did it? The president don't know who did it. If say a hundred people here, somebody got to talk. They got remedies for that too. Number one, number one, and number three don't know what number five did, and five don't know three, and so forth and so on. And if ten know ninety-nine, we got some forty-five that can take care of him. So who done it is a it, it, to me is just a, a question that people ask because they don't have nothing else to ask. Who done it? Who care about who done it? We know there's no goddamn plane not going to build it down. We know that if you're going to blow up a building, you can't uh, uh, bring yourself in that day and blow it up. You have to d d uh, line that up before, uh, beforehand and so forth and so forth. Now, back to our country being hijacked and people refuses to accept that and believe whatever the official story is, how much evidence do one need? How much evidence do one need? Now, you don't have to be brilliant, you don't have to be nothing, but you have to see what the patterns are. If you say you got a capitalistic system, and you done told us ever since you were a kid that capitalism, when we have free enterprises, and the government is not into it, because free enterprise means the government's supposed to stay out of it. And when the government stay out of it, the market will take care of itself because if you don't do the right thing, another business is going to take your place. But people, I heard that when I was a little boy. Was I a genius when I was a little boy? I ain't a genius now. How could I be a genius when I was a little boy? So now when I get up, broad daylight right on television, how many minutes I get? Four. I just got up here. People's over there talking for two minutes. Well, well, keep going. I, we'll, we'll yeah, 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 what I, finish. You want to put me down because I'm going to tell you about the capitalism <laughs> in, in free market. Ain't no goddamn free market, uh, 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 Borgia. You said it all the time. If you want to have a baseball goddamn field, you can't play basketball on it. If you got a free goddamn market, you got to have a free market. You can't have company uh, uh, merge in and uh, come with this and, 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 and monopolize it and all of that. That's not a free market. So why repeat that if you're in, uh, you know, in halfway uh, intelligent continent? You don't repeat that, but you repeat it all the time, man. And, 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 and people, for whatever reason, they want to accept that. When, they, when, the, when these people fail, they come to the governor and say, give me $700 billion. That was on TV. I ain't making this shit up. I know that. Well, that's the same goddamn governor told me that if you don't do it right, another company's going to take your place. And now somebody's going to stand up and tell me, oh, how great uh, capitalism. Capitalism is a goddamn word. And the, the shit about the free market is a word. I'm talking about what people can see. Stevie Wonder can see the same goddamn thing that everybody else sees when it comes to shit that people be throwing around about, uh, oh, free market, this and that and all of it about. Your, com your country is run by the few. The company is ran by the few. You don't have no country. And when people talk about call for your senator, call your representative, why don't you go? You can't go no goddamn way. Because your senator and the representative is owned by them folks that run your country. So why uh, just talk about this, and I don't believe that, I don't believe that. If you're in denial, go to go, go that town over in Swift, the, the syndrome. What they call that? The, what they call that? Yeah, Stockholm. Stockholm, go to Stockholm. <laughs> Stockholm.
Uh, okay, give me the one minute sign. Uh, I, I will, I will, don't worry. Okay, the, first of all, uh, thanks a lot, Andy. I always like to hear what you've got to say. Uh, we talked about the media, and I have to admit, I watch TV every now and then, only 11 and 20. 11 and 20. The other ones, I don't even bother. 11 and 20 are bad enough. Uh, there I have to question all the time. If I really want to find the truth, I might come either to church or here to the College of Complex. Uh, I look at multiple uh, sources. I mean, still make a lot of mistakes. But do I believe, I read the Tribune, do I believe it? No. Uh, okay, our leaders, same thing. How close can I get to them? This is the question I got. A couple, maybe a week or two ago, I was in a meeting and Alderman Osterman was like five feet or three feet away from me. I could see the expression on his face. Uh, he talked about having a budget from my uh, building. I, out the corner of my eye, I saw a part of it and I said to him, uh, that doesn't look like a budget to me. So I had some real connection. That connection usually ends with uh, Represent Tchaikovsky. Once in a while, I can see her face to face. Uh, but everything above that, uh, you can't get to them, and I'll talk about that later if I have time. Uh, we talked about addiction. You know, what we're addicted to in this country is money. I'm one of those few people who say repeatedly, I got more money than I need. I don't feel the need for any more money. But I think we've got a real addiction in this country for money. And huge numbers of people will sell out for the buck. What they won't, they're not addicted, we're, we're not addicted to, is truth. We're not too interested in that. Uh, denial. Uh, maybe there aren't too many here, but there are huge numbers of people. The average person I see on the street often, I have the feeling they believe the United States is the best country in the world every day in every way. You mean it isn't? I don't believe that. Oh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the new Jim Crow. Yes, I read that book. I, I would recommend that to everybody. Again, where did I read it? At church. We read it as a group. Finally, who do you believe more in the leaders? Okay, you have Andy Anderson here. A lot of people express uh, uh, skepticism as to what he said. Uh, I don't say I believe everything that Andy said. I believe he's sincere. And I had a chance to look at the expression on his face, saw him respond to repeated questions, and I've got a, at least a fair amount of feeling that I can judge what he had to say. How about the President of the United States? I've seen him face to face. He was in a Jane Addams Senior Caucus meeting years ago when he was state senator. We can't get to him. Do I believe what he has to say? Uh, I can't judge, but he said, uh, I didn't draw a, land in, a line in the sand. Hmm. Do you believe that? Uh, it was done 70 years ago. Do you believe that? Thank you. Yes. Um, what I, what, I want to, what I want to say is that I, I do have skepticism toward what Andy says, I question, but it made it so much more real to me to hear this, you know, I've heard these things before in a different way, but it made it so much more real. And another thing, he was very articulate and to the point, simple and concise and just a very good speaker. Uh, that's all I have to say. Yay! Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
about 50 years ago, there was a, a priest who went away from the Catholic Church, and he says capitalism will sell you poison if it could get away with it and make a profit. And that's what capitalism is all about. It's making a profit. Now, this thing didn't start 13 years ago or anything like that. We had the robber barons uh, during the last century. And, yeah, uh, that's right. We had the robber barons and they fought them. And eventually they got split up. But capitalism, what it does, it feeds on itself. One company takes over another. This is perfectly natural in capitalism. This is the structure of capitalism. That's why you have just a few companies controlling everything. Mass media, the uh, the environment, everything you could think of is controlled by big companies. When I was a kid, you go at the corner store and they had a delicatessen or they had a fruit market or a bakery. You can't find that anymore. It's almost impossible to find. Um, if you look at uh, Europe, the reason why Europe has social democracy, which only means that capitalism it brought in some reforms, is the labor unions and the left-wing parties that pushed it in that direction. And if somebody talks about Germany or France, and they got all these marvelous things, but if you look at the rest of Europe, like Spain, Greece, Portugal, Italy, they're going to hell, going to hell in a basket. People are committing suicide there. They don't have enough to eat. That's also capitalism. In India, the same thing. You got a few, uh, maybe one third or so, they're doing fairly well, but the rest are doing very bad. So capitalism is a system that you have to change. If you want the planet to keep living, it has to be changed. All right. All right. Okay. Um, all right. I just, um, uh, I, uh, I like Andy Anderson. I think he's a good guy. And, and I, uh, yeah. Um, and I've heard him speak on a number of different topics. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, I'm the speaker right now, so if you could uh, please uh, refrain from talking until I'm finished. And um, I don't care if you interrupt other people. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now, um, all right. Now, I and, and I don't doubt Andy's sincerity on this topic. However, so a person can be sincere, but at the same same time, sincerely wrong. Uh oh. Uh -oh. And, um, uh -oh. Now, uh, we've heard a lot of things tonight about 9 You know, I'm not, um, I don't really disagree with what he says about fracking, but we've heard a lot of things about 9 11 which are very questionable to say the least. First of all, um, now, now, let's, now, he, now Andy's talked about the, that says the buildings, the Twin Towers did not collapse. Now, I watched it on TV, and they sure as heck, I think a lot of you probably saw it on TV too, and, and uh, I'm actually, believe it or not, guys, I'm actually old enough to remember when 9-11 happened. Yeah. I watched it on TV live, and the buildings sure looked like they collapsed to me, okay? Now, the, another, you know, uh, Andy also claimed that, that Paul Wellstone's, that uh, Paul Wellstone was, was killed when his, when his airplane was shot down. It wasn't shot down, it crashed. Um, now, on a more serious note, uh, Andy appears to think that the George W. Bush administration was a bunch of infallible, evil geniuses. That they just, they just everything they did, they did right. It was all for very evil and nefarious purposes. He's just convinced that everything apparently was according to some kind of grand master plan. 
But you know, let's forget about all the this 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 myth of the, the omnipotence of the American government. Let's look what act and, and how everything went according to plan. Let's look at what actually happened during the eight years that W was was uh, um, you know the so-called president of the United States. First of all, they wanted according to their own stated goals, a peaceful, prosperous, democratic, pro-American Iraq and Afghanistan, but instead they got chaos, war, poverty, despotism, and more hatred of us uh, Americans uh, in, in, than in those two countries than ever before. Okay, yeah, mission accomplished, my ass. All right, now, second, they wanted a permanent Republican majority. That's what Karl Rove kept talking about. But what did they get instead? Well, by 2006, they had a Democratic majority in Congress. And, and then two years later, Barack Obama was elected president in 2008. Uh, so much for the permanent Republican majority. Okay, they thought that their so-called free market policies, uh, which really wasn't free market at all, as Gene pointed out, but I'm not going to get into that, that but that these pol their policies would lead to prosperity for all in an ownership society. Well, what did we get instead? We got a big stock market crash, the worst recession in the 19 since the 1930s, and a great big bailout of, of the banks that caused it all. Okay, so finally, um, George W. Bush also wanted to privatize Social Security, but he couldn't he couldn't get it through Congress, even with a Republican majority. Uh, and now he wanted. Now they were they were going on doing stuff at Gitmo, like torturing people and and stuff like that. And 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 they thought it could. They thought they could get away with this, and it would be secret, and the American people would never have to know. But it got out. You know, Bush couldn't. He couldn't keep. The Bush administration could not keep a secret. They were evil, yeah, but they were also as incompetent as all hell. They, they couldn't, uh, in fact, they were much worse back, the torture is actually going on in prior administrations, and they were better at keeping it secret than George W. Bush was. Um, and um, I think we can conclude, based on W's record, that if the Bush administration had actually been tasked with blowing up the World Trade Center, it would still be standing. <laughs> I would like to get back on topic of fracking and uh, the Keystone Pipeline. If you want to really end our addiction to, to Middle East oil, fracking and the Keystone Pipeline is the only way to go. With the use of natural gas as a transportation fuel, already UPS is going to be going to using natural gas for the trucks. And Andy was talking about using electric. They will work in small but not in medium and heavy duty trucks. That's my comment. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm also an illusionist and as an illusionist you can your agenda is to uh, I'm sorry I'm just nervous uh, to uh, words are, yeah, sorry um, distract. distract yeah to distract okay. you yes, and yes, to so make okay. and to make it so that you think you're seeing something that's really, you, you believe what you're oh, seeing, no, 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 you. but it's not. So my agenda is to, 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 to dissuade you of what you're really seeing, okay? And so our government is like that too. You know, they come in, they have an agenda, they know exactly what they're going to do. But then when 9-11 happened, they put their illusion in. And they let everybody think what they saw was real. There's many, there's many uh, soldiers that come back from the war that are in coffins that are not there. And families attend these funerals, and they go to their their coffins, and they believe they're in those coffins, but they're not there. And also with fracking. 
Um, he, Andy didn't mention that the, um, the people that are being affected by this fracking are dying. They're getting cancer. Uh, think about the uh, Beverly Hillbillies, where, where the, you know, in the very beginning of, of the show, where they show the, the Texas tea coming up. Well, just think, just think about what fracking does. It starts one place and it comes up somewhere else. So it's attacking, it's, it's going not just into those wells, it's going into your aquifer, and it's going into the rivers, and it's, it's killing people, like he said, he, he, watch Gasland, oh my gosh. I mean, to see people turn their waters on and they're brown, and to put, it, put a lighter to it, and it just, it just uh, explodes in fire. You know, the animals are getting sick. The food you eat is is get is bad. So they're so and now they're losing their homes that they had for generations, their farms. Who's taking who's gonna take all that land over? Who's gonna buy it? So think think about that. I mean like even like with, with Kennedy and think about we still don't know what happened with him. Why? As an illusionist, I can tell you I'm in a, a group where you don't tell what you do. You're in a club. You don't tell. So you, that's the same thing with our government. They're in a club, and they're not going to tell. Because it's their ethics. They can't do that. Because one finds out, as Andy has said, there's many that will die if they talk. Uh, that's got to be Tim. I might fall off. Okay. Uh, you know better. No. Oh. Uh, you know better. You're right. I should know better. Yeah. I am the technician. <laughs> yeah, the expert. <laughs> Just goes to show you that even experts are wrong. First of all, I'm going to go on the record that it was Lee Harvey Oswald that killed John F. Kennedy. Second of all, I'm going to say my own beliefs on 9-11 that it was committed by 18 hijackers who uh, came in and I believe the government account. Oh, you did it? I'm so sorry. I also can also want to believe and commend Andy that he is consistent and sincere about his beliefs and that he has backed, that he believes he's got them firmly backed up with evidence. And I think he gave probably the best presentation of his views that I've seen ever. So Andy, I gotta say thank you for that. You really did a good job tonight in the, in the presentation and your views. I have less than five minutes or four minutes now to rebut Andy on, on this stuff, but frankly, I too don't have the time to do it. Tonight's topic is on energy policy and our addiction to oil. Two weeks ago, we had a debate here on one of those alternatives, which I believe will probably figure very highly into the mix, which was the thorium molten salt reactors and the new technology that can come out with innovating of them. The reason we use oil today is because it is a high-powered source of energy and is very convenient and easy to use to truck and to pipe all over the world. And I do agree with Andy that we've had a policy in this United States to con that he who controls the oil controls the world. Well, I am also in agreement with Andy that we need to get off that policy of he who controls the oil controls the world. What really strikes about all this is that, you know, given all the claims that were made by John Kutch two weeks ago in the Thorian debate, is that our government is not even actively pursuing this line of research and that all the knowledge that the government has is being actively given away to China at this point. And that once China starts getting these reactors going and owns the intellectual property that those, that those, that, that technology can do, 
that's just one more nail in the coffin for the United States and its economic sovereignty. Because he who owns the intellectual property owns the, owns the property around the world. I will agree that something that has not been mentioned tonight is rare earths and its appropriate usage for electronics and some of the fundamental industries around our country. China again has a monopoly on that because of our own government regulation in the, in the handling of thorium and other rare earths involved with it. We actually have a lot of solutions here to our own problems. For me, one of those is going to involve thorium and its usage as a, as a reactive material. I don't have a lot of time to really talk about it and why, or why I still believe that pure capitalism is the best way to go. I believe in our country has right now something called crony capitalism or mercantilism, which I strongly disagree with. And yet you have seen that the richer get richer and the poor get poorer in the last 30 years. But I also agree it's only because we've seen a lot of the repeats of what happened in the late 19th century where unions were needed and you know when there was a few people and there was a haves and the have nots. We need we need this strong labor movement. We need to get back and reclaim our country. We do need to bring back some of that antitrust legislation that Teddy Roosevelt initiated. With that, I want to commend Andy. At least I really believe he gave a very good thorough and sincere presentation tonight, and I think we should all compliment him for really giving a very clear-cut view of his, of his ideas. Thanks, Andy. Uh, good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, you, I'm sure you all would really like to know just who was behind the World Trade Center bombings. And I'm going to tell you just who it was, because I've got the inside track. But first, a word from our sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, this is brought to you by Cribs. So the next time you want to buy a good underarm deodorant, don't settle for any criminally insane bullshit. Look for Cribs in the personal health care section of your supermarket. Thank you. And now back, oh, uh, I'm sorry, but my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I do want to thank Kenny for bringing, bringing you all your books and putting in a lot of time and effort in there. Uh, you certainly give us a lot of, here to discuss. Um, I'm going to be eclectic as usual and yeah, not on the topic, but first of all, uh, I was conscripted to do some PR work for the fat frack free Illinois crowd or organization. And if you go to the middle of this website, Illinois Greens, you'll find uh, some of the press releases that were put out regarding fracking in general, some links and some information. It's in the middle of the page right here. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about in, in doing this PR work, uh, we put one out that they're, they're having shipping depots. There, there was legislation to get permits to install another uh, shipping depot in New Orleans. And as a transportation person, I know this. The, the Illinois Central Railroad is unique among railroads in the United States in that it runs north and south. And the other railroads go east and west. As a matter of fact, all trains in the United States are identified as traveling either east or west. And the Illinois Central is unique in the sense that it is a north-south railroad. It's, it's the only one that truly has a route in that fashion. Now what came along was the Canadian National Railroad, which crisscrosses the United or Canada east to west, purchased the Illinois Central so that they literally have a T 
that crosses North American. And the other thing I came across in my research was the fact that the orders for tank cars, now this is why they, they need the pipeline, is because without the pipeline, they're maxed out. All these pipelines come together in Cushing, Oklahoma, which I've actually been to. It's a no place town. Very enlightening to go through Oklahoma, and you see an account. You have no idea how entrenched the economies of some of these states are to the energy industry. It is. It, you are not going to go down there and give a lecture like this in Oklahoma City. <laughs> I assure you, you would. You would. You would be thrown out of town. Uh, the entire, their entire lives, and their history of the state, they were boom towns and things like that. But getting back to it, there's also on order, uh, I think they're going to, they it'll take them at least three years to catch up on the number of tank cars uh, for shipping oil. And the point I'm getting to is that all this fracking oil, which certainly has detrimental effects upon the environment is simply to extract oil for sale overseas. It is not to reduce the prices here in the United States. It's pure capitalism mm -hmm. at work. And that's where I left the issue in the last one that we put out, that they're having these terminals in New Orleans to ship all this, and they get higher. They get higher prices. Gas is very pricey. I forget the figures. It's in the literature that you look it up there. But they get two or three, or even four times as much for the oil overseas as they would here in the United States. So if you think that any of that gas is going to go into your SUV parked in the parking lot of the Lincoln restaurant you're sadly mistaken. It is not going to benefit the people of the United States in terms of their energy needs. Okay, now the next topic. Um, thorium. Thorium is being advanced by the individuals who probably have bought all the rights to the thorium in the United States <laughs> or in the world. This is nothing more than a plan, long-range investment, to steer us into another energy mistake so that some guy can get rich. Now the guy who owns all the thorium in the world is going to want a lot of money and I think it's totally foolish that we should invest any, I wouldn't invest 10 cents in the research in order to make some guy rich. And that's the whole game plan. It's another continuation, but somewhat gives legitimacy to the plans that Andy was talking about here. Yeah, these guys operate together. Uh, there's been, as a matter of fact, I noticed on the inside track, there were monopolistic activities among the oil industry. Because I happened to encounter the investigators many years ago. And the oil industries all operate together. They have secret meetings. I still remember the one investigation. For some peculiar reason, all these oil executives ended up traveling to one city like Cleveland on the same weekend. And they all were giving kind of strange different reasons. Well, they all felt the need to go to Cleveland at the same time. Of course, it had nothing to do with the fixing of prices yeah, of, course, of petroleum. Uh, the last, another thing I'd like to talk about, you talk about here a lot, and it seems to be a central thing, but when I became a librarian, was going to library school and graduate school, one of the first things I was obligated to study and research was censorship. Because among librarians, it's it's, it's ingrained that we're opposed to it, that people can come in and say, you cannot have this book in your library, and things of that nature. Now, the only thing that comes to mind is, how do you affect censorship? 
it's it it has to have some concerted mechanism, some structure, some enforcement. And unless you can tell me to say, well, there are subjects, oh, they're not covered, or they're, they're blacked out. How is this blackout effective? I mean, censorship has to have some apparatus and someone in charge and doing it. In such countries that have affected censorship, had, had a board of censorship, or someone reviewing materials that were censored. All right, but that's all I got to say about censorship. By the way, I, the one thing we did discover, one of the assignments I had was to make a list of all the books that had been censored over time. And they were, actually it turned out to be the great books of the Western world. This is rather amazing. But last of all, I wanted to bring attention, since we're talking about energy, and I'm really kind of proud of this report, but I try to save energy by using public transportation. Maybe I didn't. This list here is a list of the bus routes we used to have exactly five years ago on public transit. Now, if you go to our website, you can go all the way back to when CTA was established in 1947. But if there's anything that's a sad statement on the energy policy of the United States, it's that this means of, of saving energy, and it certainly is. It's by far and away the single most efficient, I'm sorry, of all the techniques, there is nothing like public transportation for reducing our oil dependency. And to have us going backwards in this regard, these are routes that I no longer exist in the city of Chicago. But anyhow, pick one up and take a look at it. And thanks again, Andy. It was very good. When we talk about censorship, we all do our own censorship, and we rely on others to do their censorship. Whom are you going to believe? And why would you believe in them? If you swallow some well-authenticated, rather twisted, so-called fact that pertains to people's lives, and you regurgitate it, whatever else you say becomes suspect. So, be cautious about what you believe. Uh, you know, why do I believe in Jesus? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I've read the uh, four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they testify to a life that is worth living, and that uh, shows me and challenges me uh, to live accordingly. Uh, and uh, that's why I believe in Jesus. Uh, I hope others will too, but uh, the Jesus that is presented uh, by many uh, Jesusites, us Christians, uh, is a bit half-baked, and I'm sure uh, if you look at my life, I'm not a good witness uh, to Jesus. Uh, I am not uh, the most faithful of uh, witnesses. So, uh, but go out there and witness to the truth as best you can, and be Sure, that you don't swallow a lot of gobbledygook that uh, isn't worth believing and regurgitated for others. Okay, and you've got the last word. Okay.
Okay, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, just have a couple of quick comments here. Um, we, as fellow Americans, we have to have, you know, show a certain amount of compassion and patience for our other fellow Americans that have not yet learned something that's common knowledge among others. Um, there are a lot, say, take a, one, of, one of the examples I use is uh, the so-called Catholic Church Syndrome. You take a, a Catholic Church with 600 good people, conscientious, go to church every Sunday, and if you go into that church and, and say, uh, oh, by the way, uh, there's some evidence, overwhelming evidence, that Father O'Malley here has been molesting our kids for the last 18 years, the initial reaction, the church will be split. Half the congregation is going to say, well, I'm not going to look at that evidence because that can't be true. That, that's just too bad for me to think about. There's no way that can be true, so you have to be slandering the man. The other half of the congregation will say, if a shred of this is true, we have a moral, ethical, and legal obligation to look at it and take appropriate responsibility to protect the kids that are coming along behind these kids that have already been abused. That's the outlook I have. I am, I am not in any way you know, critical of people that have faith and follow the principles that Jesus taught. I have a big problem with people who promote mercenaries and killers all over the world saying that they're doing it in God's name. They're on a crusade for Christ. I have a problem with those people. Uh, for those of you that um, you know, didn't know, in early 2003, some radio station ran a contest. I forget who it was now, but I, I just remember the reading and hearing about it. They said, we have a bunch of $200 checks here unsigned. Your job for today, all of you listeners, sort through the hundreds of bills and pieces of legislation passed by the Bush administration in the first two years and see if you can find anything that benefited the American people. That is anything that would be in the spirit of the the top ten things that Jesus taught. See if you can find any legislation that is not the spirit of the Antichrist. Nobody could claim a single $200 check all day long. Jim Hightower wrote a book in 2003 called Thieves in High Places. And he, he completely dispelled the idea that the Bush administration was populated by incompetent, bumbling people that couldn't do anything. His book uh, has like seven pages with fine print listed, a few hundred bills. Some of them are highlighted here and there. And he says, take a look at this. This is what they've accomplished in the first two years. Get rid of environmental laws. Get rid of environmental police. Get rid of inspectors that inspect meats, plants. Let the oil companies pollute to their heart's content. Run wild one thing after another. He said, put on your boots, your hip waders, a gas mask, and your rubber gloves, and wade into this mess and just see if you can find anything that is just not basically the essence of evil. And he asked the question, he said, if you've been, if you've been wondering why there's so many sex scandals and things, uh, scandals on the Republican side of Congress and the Senate, well, look at this list. This, this list of bills passed is toxic sludge, morally offensive, he said, Ordinary people with a pulse and a conscience won't go anywhere near this stuff. Whether you're Democrat or Republican, if you have a shred of decency and conscience, you won't pass this legislation. To pass this kind of agenda that the Bush Cheney has, you need perverts. You need people with no ethics, morals, and conscience. It's like they hung a big neon sign over the White House that said, if you have no ethics, morals, and conscience, Come on down. We got a job for you in the Senate and Congress, and we'll help you get elected using the electronic machines to steal the elections, which is what they did. Uh, they've been stealing elections and, until the public disgust finally reached a crescendo in 2006. 
That was two years after the country was psychologically raped in broad daylight in 2004. The 2004 election, for those of you that don't know, the 2004 election that was, was a landslide where Bush and Cheney were voted out of office. They lost it by millions and millions of votes nationwide. The Las Vegas odds makers called it at about uh, 7 or 7.30 at night when a high enough percentage, a mathematical percentage of the votes were in in key states. They said, even if all the rest of the votes come in for Bush Cheney, there's no way they can mathematically flip the results so that they could win. It's, it's like uh, watching a football game when uh, the score is 73 to 7 with a minute left in the fourth quarter. There's no mathematical way that that team that's got only seven points is going to win it, so you can call it. Red Auerbach of the Boston Celtics used to light up his cigarette, a cigar. He had a famous Boston coach, he said, when the game was won, when it was mathematically impossible for the other team to win, it was over. They were still playing half the fourth quarter, but when the game was over, he'd light up his cigar. Well, that's what the Las Vegas odds makers did in 2004. They lit up a cigar and they said, it's over. We voted these bastards out of office. We voted these criminals out. The public did their job. They got out the vote nationwide. And then after midnight, those states that were called for, you know, was it um, Kerry Edwards? Edwards Kerry in 2004, right? Uh, Gore, Gore and Lieberman in 2000? Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was Kerry Edwards 2004. Sometimes I confuse the two. Anyway, the states that went solidly for Kerry Edwards, they just flipped the vote total in 11 states with the electronic machines after midnight. We woke up at 8 o'clock in the morning, turned on the news to celebrate our new president. He says, oh, it was close. It was 59 to 49 percent, 51 to 49 or something like that. But Bush Cheney, they squeaked it out. So we've been getting psychologically and financially raped for 13 years in this country. We're in our 13th year of this bullshit that really started with the election of Bush Cheney. Uh, and it, you know, it started in 1980 with Reaganomics, but it really shifted into high gear with the 2000 election. So we, we have to be, you know, keep trying and keep, you know, just point people in the right direction. When, when I tell you something is a proven fact, it's not my opinion that it's a fact. What I'm doing is giving you the, the condensed uh, database summary of like, you know, 500, 600, 1,000 scientists from universities all over the world that have published the results. Uh, once a database gets big enough and it stands up to the scrutiny of uh, inspection and testing, then society begins to move forward and accept it. Now, there's... I agree with Charlie 100%. Uh, tra public transportation, if we had it, would be excellent and we should... That's one of the ways that they're talking about revitalizing America is building high efficiency public transportation that doesn't run on fossil fuels. We can have electric trains or hydrogen powered trains uh, that can be very efficient. Two of the people here that gave rebuttals, I won't mention any names, have over the years been doing what I call the right side of the Catholic Church syndrome, just saying, well, that can't be true because I don't believe it. I don't care. There, there's a famous case of an army general that was being presented a, a type of uh, electronic espionage, um, a, new, a new type of uh, you know, spying, and he, he said, the general is famous for saying, even if you can prove to me that this works, I'm still not going to believe it. <laughs> even if you can flat out prove that this works and demonstrate this work, there's no way I'm believing it because that's just too far out. Well, that's what we're seeing on the subject of 9-11 is people just flat out refuse to look at the evidence. There's, there's three stages, you know, three stages of basic ignorance. You know, there's, there's the normal blissful ignorance where you haven't seen something yet, you know, like the half the Catholic, like the whole congregation, nobody's seen it yet. They're all ignorant of a proven crime. The second stage is offensive ignorance, 
after you've been presented with the evidence and you continue to say, well, I, I'm not going to believe that. And it's offensive because if there's people dying, like in the wars we support and the environmental degradation, or all the people that have died as the result of radiation poisoning in Iraq and Afghanistan, driven by the myth of 9-11, that's offensive ignorance to keep saying that we were attacked by Al-Qaeda, now we gotta go hunt for these terrorists all over the world. And you'll find that the only place they're hunting for Al-Qaeda terrorists, you overlay a map of where the oil-rich spots are, and one of the persons that can't handle these facts just got up and left. Um, it's, under, it's, un, it's understandable. Uh, Here's the other one. You know, at some point, the evidence becomes so overwhelming that you can't maintain any credibility being in a crowd saying that's not true when people are doing what Gene said. Look around with your own eyes and ears, right? Yeah. Or as Gene says, look at that picture. Does that look like something that's on fire? Give my ass a break. <laughs> Give my ass a break. And uh, those of you that think we saw pictures of the towers falling, it was designed that way. The explosive layers went off from the top down, so the wave of explosions that were turning the building to dust, they were going down as the cloud was forming, right? So I, I, if you watch that cloud, you can see the layers. It's moving down the building, and by the time it gets to about 20 floors up, the whole building is encased in this giant cloud of dust where you don't see the bottom. But the, the proof, for those of you that want proof, just look at the pictures of the ground where the dust settled. What's dustification? Dustification is when concrete bricks are converted to microscopic dust in seconds. Not, not dust where you have chunks from normal explosives, but where the dust particles are one-tenth the size of a red blood cell. And the, 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 the chemist, uh, physicists and chemistry professors uh, led by Niels Herrick from Copenhagen in 2008, they started, they ran a two-year study of the dust samples from the World Trade Center, and they, they came to the conclusion that, you know, the buildings, the, twi the Twin Towers were just simply converted to microscopic dust. Now, there were some chunks that flew out, but 90%, 95% of the building, the hundreds of thousands of tons of concrete and steel, were converted to dust. Isn't there dust any time you okay. demolish a building? Oh, yeah. There's a, well, any time you demolish a building, look at the pictures of the Seattle Sing Dome. King Dome, you know, they had the dome, uh, they had a cloud of dust that went like this, poof, and then the building collapsed. You had a big pile of rubble. In 9-11, what you had was this cloud of dust that went whoosh, way up into the air, you know, not driven by gravity, but driven by the explosive power. The, the cloud of dust and the girders were going up and out at 60 miles an hour. And if you log on to any of the, you know, the good 9-11 sites or you know, a lot of other sites, these videos are all over the internet. They've gone viral so they can't be suppressed anymore. So you, you, can, you know, anybody that, it's easy to understand, as Professor Griffin said, the hard part is stepping through the psychological barrier and looking at the evidence. Once you look at the evidence, just like the Catholic Church Syndrome, at some point, you look at the crime scene evidence, everything else, you say, well, uh, Father O'Malley is guilty. We have to do something about it. And then the, the priest, uh, the, you know, the Pope reached that point. The hierarchy of the Catholic Church finally reached that point, what, a year or two ago, where they said, we can't hide this anymore. I mean, the public knows, and people are filming it with cameras and everything else and turning, you know, with the Internet, you can't hide stuff like you used to be able to. Um, one final point, somebody said, um, how could you keep something like this quiet if it was a big... Uh, coordinated effort. Well, 25,000 people worked on the Manhattan Project, and they kept that quiet right up until the time the bomb went off at Alamogordo. I mean, they, they, our country has the ability to hide certain projects when they want to. But now with the, the total control of the media, the media is like six big billionaire, multi-billionaire conglomerates. We don't have 50 small stations anymore for television. We got six big media outlets that control what's on the airwaves. So there it is. But I, I would say anybody that legitimately wants to move forward 
and not continue to print, pretend that these realities aren't reality. Um, I can give you sources uh, any anytime anybody wants to contact me. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming, and I hope to see you soon again.